Everybody, welcome to another edition of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Austin, the show of Patron, the show of Tipsy Texan. Today's guest is the amazingly experienced, the wonderfully charming staple of Austin, Texas, Mr. David Allen, one half of the brilliant duo Tipsy Texan. We talk about coffee, we talk about UT, we talk about cats's never closes. We talk about Patron. We talk about so many different things because Dave has been in this industry for a long time and he's done so much for so many people in terms of education, in terms of writing, in terms of just spreading overall the cocktail wealth and the cocktail knowledge. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed this epic conversation with David Allen. Uh, you know, good things come out of these situations. You know, I, I work for Patron Spirits now. Yeah. And um, the way I met, the way I got in my foot in the door with that company was by talking shit about it at a bar loudly. <laughs> I think it was, to, I think Joyce Garrison was working at the W. I think that's who it was. Yeah. And I was like talking to her about, I just, you know, young, smart ass bartender. She's sure. From Mexico. I know all these things about tequila. I'm such a badass. Right. And um, talking about, you know, Patron, Patron, Patron. And then this guy taps me on the shoulder. He's standing next to me at the bar. I was completely <laughs> oblivious of him. He's like, hey, what's your name? I'm David. Uh, he's like, I'm Mike. I work for Patron. Yes. And I was like, okay. Let me put my whole entire leg <laughs> in my mouth now. I, you know, I recall, in fact, that I felt so bad about how arrogant and kind of like off the cuff I was being. Normally, that's okay with me. But I've, lear- <laughs> but I've learned a lot about this industry and about how people really do work hard to do these things. And like whether it's a different vision or whatnot, that's like that's irrelevant, right? But we're all working, trying to do good work. And that's something I've, I've respected about, obviously, the stuff that you do. But I went as far as to like send you a, an apology letter because no, I felt you did. so it was bad. Great. No, you sent me a note and we kissed a made up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, like, you know, this guy, Mike uh, from Patron Spirits has become a good friend of mine. Yeah. And now coworker. Uh, you know, his company became a big client of ours for when I was running. Tips right, Tyson. right. And then, you know, you never know where things are going to end up three years later. It's so I'm strange, like, right? A spokesperson for the company. Yeah. And it and wouldn't have all over the world talking about them <laughs> you, in just, a good way. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you just can't, you, you can't do that stuff and, and not with uh, reconcile in a sense right and then sometimes sometimes it doesn't matter but like you just can't shoot your mouth off like that like i, I thought i could at that point because i was new to this whole thing kind of not really understanding so it really meant it it was important to me to make sure i reconciled that because i felt like a dick about that whole well thing. in our industry and, and this is the thing that everyone has to know our industry is just incredibly incestuous like sure. everybody knows everybody and I, I know that you talk to anyone in any industry and they'll mm-hmm. tell you that but at least at least in this industry that i've been working in my whole adult life this this business is is so dependent on your reputation, Absolutely. so dependent on the relationships that you curate yeah. and develop, and it just you never you can't have bad blood because it it will almost invariably bite you in the ass at Haunt some you. point, Absolutely. or at least make you feel bad. Sure, and that's something. It's a it is a hard lesson to learn. I've had to learn it. I think lots of people have had to learn it. Um, you you look at the dialogue amongst the people who I think of like as the leadership right group, right in our community. And the dialogue has changed lately and it's become, you see a lot less like ad hominem attacks. You see mm. a lot more positivity, um, at least in the people I respect. Sure. Don't get me wrong. I see all kinds of like immature. Yeah, but it takes all kinds anyway. You know? And I'm like, yeah, that's that. That's the guy who's not going to get the job. Right, that's right. That's the guy who's not going to get the investors. And that's the person who's not going to get the article in the magazine. You're totally whatever. right. Because yeah. these guys over here are, are fun, smiley, lovable, positive sure. people. And a good influence on other people. Yeah. I mean, people flock to that. I think we do want positivity. Obviously, misery loves company, but even more so in a greater power is it loves power. miserable company. That's you know, right. Who wants yeah. that company? That's yeah. like the old. It's like Eater, like before Eater sort of reformed itself locally. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah, you could you could post some nasty crap on Eater, and and yeah, twenty people would dogpile. I'm like, yeah, that guy he blows. Right, uh, right. But I remember yeah, that who wants shit. to be around that. It's horrible. Yeah, it doesn't help anything. Yeah, you think the whole it it is vinegar. hard enough. It's hard enough. 
to launch a brand or open a restaurant or do anything in this business. Yeah. So many forces are working against you. You don't need that crap. Yeah, no shit. Especially this week, it's been like piled on heavy at the new uh, year. Like Levy's gone, Metal's gone. I mean, maybe they had their gone? problems. Yeah, Metal's closed rise. now too. But it's just been like one of those kind of years where now we're all. I think we we opened oh, too many restaurants opened. You know, people got that sort of I think post recession. Yeah, uh, the the, uh, the ant on. chomping at the yeah, bit. Yeah, like, oh, I got this money. I want to spend on a place or whatever. And I think we just I think we opened too many places. People see the statistics and see all these people moving to Austin. Right. It's like, yeah, like some of them also have kids and live in the suburbs and, and cook food at home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, you know. It's, yeah, it almost just feels... It's it going to feels... come. Like, it just, we got... I've, I've watched this happen before. I've been here. I've been yeah, working in the business. Been I've been lived here my whole life. Yeah. And I've been working in the business since the 90s. So I remember in the, to- in the dot-com boom, mm-hmm. you know, all these places opened, all these kids had all these fancy cars and everyone was blowing all this money downtown. Right. And these swanky bars, and then and then it just you know the it bubble burst. Evaporated. A lot of places closed, and a lot of Porsches got put up for a resale. <laughs> Repo, you know? repoed Porsches. Yeah, I think that's where I got my Porsche. Yeah. yeah. So that so that's you know we're just gonna go through another little correction, I think. Um, but you know what's gonna be awesome is the next wave of built of restaurant operators. Yeah. Are gonna move into finished construction or like finished build outs. Yeah, yeah. So they're gonna get like an incredible bargain. <laughs> they'll walk into it. They're gonna walk, like, oh, walk, walk into a walk in and yeah. an event hood and you know the have a great setup these traps just... and all the stuff that they didn't want to pay for. So. That's amazing. So you said you're one of the true Austinites in the fact that you've been here your whole life. I was born here. Where where about in Austin? I grew up in Oak Hill. Oak Hill, okay. Um, back before went back when Oak Hill was, you know, a pastoral <laughs> pastoral uh, area yeah. of town, like on the edge of edge of town not like on the way to Driving Springs yeah. or, B, or B Cave yeah. uh, it was a really uh, beautiful peaceful quiet uh, place you mm-hmm. know it was, it was one of those things where I was like really glad I look I don't think I had any way of knowing it then but I look back at it now I was like man it was a really cool time to grow up in Austin yeah um, because especially for my situation because we lived in Oak Hill which was was a suburb but like you know eight minutes from downtown right in right those days and because of the busing laws at the time, I went to O'Henry Middle School and Austin High. Uh-huh. So I got exposed. Oh, you went to Austin High. Okay. Austin High, yeah. yeah. And so I got exposed to like the way the other halves live yeah. um, in more ways than one. So it was, was it, a, it, it? Do you feel like it's a more diverse city now than it was then? I, know, I, I, I don't go back. I go back 15 not, I mean, years or so. The area of town that I lived in w- was not. Like, pretty homogenous, diverse, right? Yeah. yeah. Suburb at all. Um, but that's why we had busing. I mean, that's why they. that's why they bust you into West Austin with kids from East Austin. And yeah. So, so in theory, everyone would mingle, but I right. think that proved out. It still not, clicks and stuff. Yeah, how it is. Yeah. But at least you get, at least you're like, oh, there's other people who don't look like me and don't come from the same right. background that I come from. So even if they weren't like your besties, yeah. at least you were more empathetic to other what, what were your folks doing in Austin at that, that point? Uh, my dad grew up in the laundry dry, and dry cleaning business mm-hmm. and has always been in that business. His parents owned a big dry cleaners in, on East First Street. And my mom is a freelance writer and editor, um, a part-time journalist. Yeah. Or whatever. I oh wow. She 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 worked for a handful of different magazines when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, just kind of editing and. So you know, it's a, that's an interesting contrast if you think about yeah. it. Like. Yeah, back in those days, it was like pre. She wasn't early. She was an early adopter of, of home publishing, you know, computers. And right, stuff. right, yeah. But uh, I grew up in the IBM Selectric days of like, Dude. Chick, 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 you know, like the loud ass <laughs> yeah. typewriter, and the dining table never had dinner on it because it always had galleys. <laughs> I always had my mom's like proofs on it from stuff she was editing or writing. That's so great. Did you have? Do you have any siblings? I have a sister, younger or older. Uh, she's seventeen months younger than me. She lives in Nashville. She's a social worker. No kidding. So, what was your? What would you say your? High school. So, all right. So we, you know, we had a little bit of conversation about Star Wars earlier. A little bit of conversation about '80s music and stuff. And so, the thing that kind of like was actually a little bit surprising to me is, and maybe these are pictures from your twenties. I don't know where you have that Robert Smith haircut that you keep <laughs> you keep showing that picture, right? It's on Facebook and shit. But you didn't. That, that's more of, of an ode to my old of having a hair hair like oh that, having you know, just hair just having like, hair to like do something <laughs> with it uh, to toss to that tease was less of a musical change, all of it. Yeah. But so. Seemingly, if your mom and, and I hate to step out and make this assumption, but if your mom is doing journalism, I would imagine she's probably relatively cultured, has a lot of interest in the arts and things. Is that is that not correct? You know, I I think you're talking about how I said that the I didn't know about eighties music, yeah, until yeah, nineties. Yeah. yeah, it was sort of like a throwback thing. By the time I found out about it, right? You know, we lived in the suburbs. My dad was a workaholic, so he was always uh, on the road, mm-hmm. and then my mom. Uh, 
you know, my mom was raising kids. We didn't have like a bunch of people coming over all the time. There wasn't like MTV existed, but we went, we didn't watch it. And I don't really know why. Like I, I started watching MTV um, in, in middle school. Yeah. That's when my memories of popular, popular music of my own time started. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. when I was a kid, I just listened to my mom's oldies stuff. You know, I listened to Janis Joplin and the Beatles and all that stuff because yeah. that's what my mom listened to. Yeah, that's how, uh, how a lot of us learn, right? And get so it I, but of... I didn't, you know, all my friends who I went to high school with were like all over uh, The Cure or Madonna or whatever. And sure, like, sure. Yeah, I learned about all of that stuff like way, way later. And, but you were hanging with the 60s music. Yeah, I was sort of stuck in time. That's not bad, though. Listening to Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. <laughs> Still not, but that's fine. <laughs> it's timeless stuff. No, it's great. And that, that stuff <clears> is so... Uh, sort of foundational to me that when I find out people who don't know like those references, yeah, it really makes me kind of sad just because the qu- the quality of that music is sort of timeless. Some yeah. of the best harmonies ever constructed Incredible. on record, it's yeah. Simon and Garfunkel. It's yeah. insane. It makes Bon Iver or all these other fucking so folk guys look I, terrible. I hear today, I, and I hate to be like that. Oh, these kids, you know, whatever <laughs> thing, because I I remember. <laughs> That's what my dad thought about a lot of the shit we listened right, to. Right, and I was wondering, is it me, or is it the time, I or is it the music? I think it's both. I think popular music has gotten really insipid. Um, and even, if you, you know, compare it to, like, candy pop from the 60s. Right. That was still a lot more interesting. Sure, the me. Beach Boys at some point were considered were that considered way. Music, and they wrote right. one of the greatest records of all time yeah. coming from that background. So Yeah, a lot more, like, classical influence. Like, a lot more yeah. musicality going on. Because it was on. closer to those eras, in a yeah. sense, right? Not as much tech. And technology was yeah. much less in it fluid and inside the production and stuff yeah. like that you know well what what kind of stuff were you in into in high school oh i was all over metallica uh, <laughs> for sure but like and, so, so you know, were you playing music at all i was in band and uh, hung out with all a lot of musicians but i was never so i was fun, never though. much of a musician yeah um but it's always been around me were you, did My parents you, met in the Longhorn Band. No kidding. Uh, on the marching field at UT. Uh, well, that's where Royal, it's Royal <laughs> Memorial Stadium. So, I guess I was conceived. The aphrodisiac uh, of the uh, field. Yeah. So I was conceived because of music, I suppose. Well, I think that in the, and alcohol, probably. I don't know. It's a it's a eighty twenty, or for some, a sixty forty. I'm sure I wouldn't have been conceived if there hadn't been alcohol <laughs> and or and or music mm. at play there, you know. But academically, was, was there anything that kind of appealed to you? In high school, or just kind of you just kind of do it. I really enjoyed high school. I was I really enjoyed the social aspect of high school. I was yeah. very involved uh, with you know with band. I was the band president, and I uh, was involved with student council and a bunch yeah. of different volunteer organizations. So I, I you know I think a lot of people that I know didn't love high school. I had so much fun. I for years after high school, I thought, is life ever going to be as good as it was? <laughs> At high school, because we just had so much fun. I had an awesome friend group. Yeah, um, a lot of whom, like, I'm still friends with. And no came, kidding, came to our wedding. Oh, you that's know? so great. Um, my best friend from high school flew in from from Italy to be there with no his shit. wife, who's one of my other best friends. That's from amazing. High so I, you know, the, I have fond memories of it. And also, it was an awesome time to be a kid in Austin. You know, and I, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm I don't know what it's like to be a kid in Austin now. It's yeah. still cool, but like the '90s was just fun to a fun time to be a kid in Austin. We had open campus lunch, so like we you know, I was like you know 14, mm-hmm. and we could walk to Thundercloud Subs. On, oh no shit! On a uh, Lake Austin there, yeah. Or drive to we would go to House Park barbecue for lunch. You know, wow. it was just a very carefree time uh, to be a kid here, or you know, be a high school kid. Yeah, here. absolutely. Because um, the city was you know it was happening, but it wasn't like crazy congested and also in those days most people were still from austin like, yeah or had been here a long time you know i i know a little bit about you and we were talking about this about how there's lots of of those kind of details as someone's kind of coming into form or coming into the industry that we don't really know and they're kind of unclear but the, but the thing for me is that was it at that time in austin and i don't want to emphasize too much on like you being out and proud and all of that but was that ever difficult for you, like in high school and then going into college being, because I think you seems like you've always been comfortable with your sexuality, <laughs> that you've always been comfortable with who you are. I mean, I wouldn't know, but it feels that way. Like you've okay, always I, been honest with yourself. On TV. So, you know, you have to keep in mind that um, there were no gays um, in the 90s. You know, like no. they just weren't, they just didn't exist. Like, yeah. have, yes, of course. they Sure, they sure. Were, they, were, they were all over the place. But yeah. like. I I graduated from high school before Ellen DeGeneres came out on on her show. Oh like, wow! Like I remember, it was that summer after I graduated from uh from high school. Um, no, it was the it was the next spring. It was like April or something mm-hmm. of nineteen ninety seven, I think. 
and I was in, I remember I was in Marin County. I was at a friend's house. Mm-hmm. He was having like a, a Ellen watching party because I nice. knew all of that, that was I watched happen. it. I mean, I love that, that show. That was like a big, like that was, the, that changed the thing, you know? Like when I was in high school, the kid, there were a couple of like noteworthy gays, yeah. but they were like, you know, political activist gays. They weren't like, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't like uh, the quarterback gay. Right. Like you, right. You can be that now. It's not as common. It hasn't, we haven't completely turned that around. Right. But it's but like, it is like completely okay to be like an openly like gay student council president. Yeah. Uh, pop, oh yeah. Popular, you know, uh, uh, kid in high school. Mm. And when I was in high school, there were some gay kids, but they were like, they were sort of like the activists. It, it was not, it was not considered mainstream. It was yeah, very, yeah. um, you know, sort of sc- scandalous and and weird. You know, it was yeah. just it was kind of weird. And so, but I, and also, I like I didn't. It was so weird to me that I didn't even I didn't identify as that. Like right. I didn't I didn't think like oh shit I don't want to be like that guy. Yeah, he's the gay. It, it was just like it was so other and different to me. Mm-hmm. Um, that I just didn't I didn't even identify with it. Right. Um, that took a uh, time. <laughs> there was a publication in circulation in those days. And I, I hope that, that their archives are somewhere because it was just glorious. Uh-huh. It was called The Fag Rag. <laughs> and it was a scandalous little pamphlet type uh-huh. publication that was like gratuitously sexual. Right. It had like a help column called Ask Fag Hag. <laughs> it had a, a, a like a medical advice column. It had mm-hmm. the horoscopes, like the <laughs> WHO horoscopes. So this is not, we're talking 90s. This is in the mid 90s. Wow. Uh, you know, I want to say like, 93 to 98 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, wow. So they were around for, you know, four or five years if I remember correctly. Um, it started as like a little, like just like a fold-up pamphlet like you would get like about a stagecoach museum or something, right. you know. Uh, <laughs> but it had like, you know, two guys grabbing each other's junk on the cover. Your ass itches? <laughs> Read this. like Yeah. That. And uh, that and the fag rag was just like funny. It had like, uh, you know, in those days, Austin was such a small town that it had like, it had a gossip column where they would just talk about all these queens that they had seen like passed out at the club or, you know, <laughs> making out with so-and-so. Or, right, know? right. Because in those days, you would go out and know it, people everywhere you went. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's not like that anymore. Because it's, um, so, it's so much larger. Especially so much... in that community was so small. Yeah. The city was so much smaller in those, in you know, 20 years ago. So it's like you, you weren't, you, as you said, you didn't even identify with that. Like you're just kind of, it's an element around so you. But I, I remember, no, I'm, well, I'm getting to this. I'm getting there. Thank so, you. So uh, <laughs> this this publication existed and uh, Waterloo Records there at Six and Lamar. Mm-hmm. That was like, you know, a, a main attraction for like a 15 or 16 year old, like progressive Austinite. Like, yeah. we spent so oh, yeah. much time in Book People, Waterloo Records, and Waterloo Ice House. So know? much money. Because the record store, like, that, yeah. was the, that was the jam, like, in those days before Xboxes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, we they had this huge selection of literature, like free, you know, pamphlets for shows. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, people's business cards for acupuncture. Well, you know, you know that kind of just bulletin board mm-hmm. type stuff. And one of the things that was stacked amongst the you know Austin Chronicles and uh, whatever mm-hmm. was the fag rags. No shit. And I, and I remember seeing the cover of it from time to time and thinking that like it would catch my eye, of yeah. course. But I certainly wasn't going to pick it up because it had like you know dudes in thongs on the cover or whatever <laughs> and one day i'm with my friend uh mike and he grabs a giant stack of them and puts them in my back stuffs them in my backpack and he's like let's put these in all the football players lockers uh, um ah. at, at school like yeah when, yeah when we get to school next week but of course i was like fuck yeah i finally get to read the fag rat yeah you know? yeah and so i you know rushed home <laughs> locked myself away to to read to have my whole world opened up you know yeah and so I re- that was the first time i started like um realizing that this that this was a thing that that, that there were people out there like this. like you yeah then yeah. Uh, this was like a very catty kind of trashy publication mm-hmm. this was not like wholesome entertainment at all um, <laughs> right but look but it wasn't porn you know this wasn't right, like right. this was the in the days before you know adult websites yeah and stuff too so that's an that's one thing i'm really that i am thankful for growing up as a gay kid before the like widespread like sexualization of gays and and or just yeah uh, just like before before there was like grinder and all those apps and yeah. all the like all the sex websites and all that just stuff so much i just saturation. got to be a kid and didn't have access to anything like that yeah and i'm kind of glad because i feel like very well adjusted because i had normal relationships i wasn't mm-hmm. like you know 
I was, you know, you weren't finding like, people in your proximity to fuck around. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't like, I wasn't worried about, you know, STDs in high school or whatever. Like yeah, some yeah. of this stuff, some of the stuff that's the reality of what some gay kids deal with today and mm-hmm. um, having access to all that adult stuff, you know, I'm just like, whatever that stuff's great when you're an adult sure uh, but, but as a kid it, defor- <laughs> it deforms you man. yeah it's weird it totally so I, i'm glad i got to grow up with like normal friends normal relationships and found, i got to find out about adult things as an adult yeah instead of, in an organic way instead yeah. of yeah because i think technology has this way of turning kids into adults when they're not ready yet college you know? was a good way the my first semester at ut when i was actually um a, of college age I, I graduated from ut as an adult not college age <laughs> but i did go to one semester at ut when i was 18 and i found out about like the lgbt yeah, support yeah, yeah. group and like made some friends that way and like went to my first gay bar um and you know that was but i was you know a freshman in college like that's a good time to like get exposed to all of those right, things right. and because my high school friend group was really supportive my family was really supportive i never had like any uh of those negative side effects that right that kids people have. disown you none of the, yeah, yeah. None of it's, ho- it's horrible when that happens yeah. I, I still don't understand why people do that to yeah. each other doesn't make sense so you went to ut so, so you twice twice <laughs> <laughs> so the twice. first time you said you're 18 of age of of yeah. child age if you will what i was college aged college UT, aged, and uh i had a i had a home run semester i had two d's and two f's <laughs> Uh, and was on scholastic probation and respectfully declined uh, <laughs> registering <laughs> for the spring semester. <laughs> what? <laughs> what what uh, what happened? Were is it, were you getting to all those fag rags? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I just I don't know. I was you know on my own. Like, I mean, I moved out like right after graduation. Like, yeah, I, I lived in a house uh, with friends and you know probably drank too much beer and mm-hmm. whatever else those people were doing at 18 <laughs> um, mad dog you know i was working i'll tell you what it was i mean like i was working i started working at katz's that summer back when katz's was like a hot spot it was yeah jam. like it was the place to work downtown because it was like 24 hours right right always a party everybody made good money you know and um you know i just got exposed to adult like lifestyle like i met like you know grown-ups yeah. and hung out with grown-ups for the first time it's kind life. of appealing was, right yeah and Total it was fun. Just... i just wasn't i don't think i was um I just wasn't like emotionally prepared to go to college. And right. so um, I just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I took a couple semesters off. I actually did go back when I was like 19 mm. to uh, to do culinary school. My boss oh, no kidding. Uh, at the restaurant so you're um, still at had then? me go uh, into the culinary program at, at Austin Community College, mm. um, which was just starting up a brand new program. Like when, when we first, in our first semester, we met at, uh, at Central Market. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. That we didn't have a kitchen. The campus hadn't been built yet. It was Eastview. Wow. Or it is still their culinary campus. But we that's met crazy. At, we met at the like dinky ass cooking school at Central Market. And um that's where we first, you know, started cooking. And how and long then, did you then, do that? Uh five semesters. Five semesters, okay. Yeah. I took it, I basically took everything they had in those days. Does it end in a some kind of degree so it does program? now it does now in those days there was a certificate program and then they they did a two-year like an actual like associates program right i didn't do it because i i went uh i moved to houston to help up in a restaurant down there was it so that was, was it, like a formative moment we the was cats, it connected to so you're at cats is in austin and we decided to open a restaurant in houston it's the same owners you could you have the same owner it was the ish, son the son the son yeah and then you go down there and kind of work on that to open up for them yeah i went down originally to just be i was supposed to be the trainer Mm -hmm. and i was there three years later holy shit one of the main managers yeah wow what you when uh when was this 2000 2000 in october of 2000 how did it go yeah i can't believe that was so long ago i sent the owner i sent barry katz a note the other day i was like happy 15th anniversary of katz's houston uh because his dad's restaurant's been closed for like three years now a lot yeah and uh which is also hard to believe. Sure, it is. but um, yeah, fifteen years of Cats as Houston going strong. Did you like being down in Houston? I loved it. I had so I had so much fun. I probably had too much fun actually. And I think I remember making the decision that it's like, okay, Austin's my home. I need to get back, and I need to go back to school. Yeah, I really felt like I was sort of spinning my wheels because uh, I'm you know at the time twenty three, I guess, mm-hmm. and uh, or twenty five, whatever, and just like working for the same restaurant. I've been there seven years. You wow. Know? And it was a huge opportunity. Loved doing it. Don't, I have no regrets about it. But it, you know, I, I believe this. The restaurant business can 
uh, work can can really work miracles for a person. Mm-hmm. Like it, there are not that many industries where a person like who didn't go to college can make a six figure salary, right, or right, be, right. or become a millionaire opening like dozens of restaurants or whatever. Like mm-hmm. there's not a lot of industries where you, where you, where the sky's the limit. And I do yeah. I believe that about the restaurant. No, industry. I totally agree. With I you. think the restaurant industry can break people from shyness. I think it can bring break bring people out. Like yeah. I think it I think it has an incredible ability to bring people together. I mm-hmm. love this business. Uh, I'm a lifer. What was, so what was it for you that, that drew you to it? Like, so, or rather, what kept you doing it? Was it the people? Was it the fact that it was able to help you curate some of your skills interpersonally? I, I've always been attracted to it. You know, my, my first job when I was 16 was at some really shitty little restaurant on Barton Springs Road mm-hmm. called South Austin Steakhouse. And the tagline yeah. was, this ain't no ordinary steakhouse, <laughs> except it was. It was. Beyond ordinary. <laughs> yeah, it didn't last very long. Uh, I worked there. I worked at Flipnotics on, oh, on shit, Barton yeah. Springs when I was right out of high school. Uh, I've always like wanted to be around that business. Yeah. And uh, my a friend, at, a friend I, I had just met at the time, a guy named Pete Pickerel, was um, directing a play at Austin High. He was mm-hmm. an Austin High graduate who was coming back as like an alumni guest director. Right, right. And I had been my like, all throughout high school. I'd always hung out with the theater kids. I like hung out in the theater. I watched all their shows. Yeah. I like, helped out and volunteered sometimes, but I'd never actually auditioned for a <laughs> show. Uh, and I, and the, and the, like the clock is ticking, you know, it's like the spring semester of my senior year. Right. Um, and my, uh, my friends are all like auditioning for this show and someone said, Hey, you should audition. And I auditioned. I got accepted for the show. It was Alice in Wonderland. What were you and, playing? Uh, I played the. Uh, I played the. Uh, what's the guy? Lewis Carroll. I, it, it was, oh, really? It's a, it's a weird production. Yeah. Is uh, he like doing a voiceover? Kind or something of narrating. Or? Yeah, yeah, narrating yeah. the thing. Um, oh, interesting. So I was, I was him. And then, were you on then, heroin when you? T- <laughs> I wish I had. I dis- I had <laughs> or was it discovered. morphine? I can't it was remember. One of the adult pleasures I hadn't discovered. Yet. <laughs> um, and it was just so much fun. It was such a blast. It was just such a. I was such a cool experience of being part of a team and like yeah. you know it's like doing a restaurant opening you know you go through this intense period of like learning all this stuff together right and right put on the show and you're part of this big I, thing it is a perfect analogy for it yeah. it is it is this crew it is the stage it is production yeah every night and i love i love that feeling and i think that's probably why i didn't realize it until just now but like I, that that feeling of that 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 is such a thrill to me mm-hmm. of being part of like a of a production yeah that whatever it is like fantasy bar draft or all these events that we put on right right um, all kinds of restaurant openings that i've worked on in the years since um it's that that rush of like getting a crew together rocking it out doing something big getting acknowledged yeah. for your work and it's very it's just fun, fun kind of because that because i had never played sports in, in high school mm. and i have to think that that's like the non-athletic kids experience of being in a team <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah like no what other teams are there yeah. like you get debate team i guess there's drama like you saying, and there's band. I mean, band is there's well, a band, band too, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, yeah, you're right. So anyway, that that um that fellow Pete who directed our play, mm. were he was a manager at Katz's, and he's like, look, they need a bus boy, and um, you know, call this guy uh, who's the GM there, and um, tell him you want to that I that I refer to you, you know. Mm. And so I I call this guy, and I'm like, hey. Um, I'm David. I'm calling about the bus boy. Job. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, I already got somebody. Oh, uh, I don't need you. And he's a really crass, incredibly <laughs> beautiful uh, person who I love to date, right. uh, named Ty Carey. Um, he's like, no, I already got somebody. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, well, Pete Pickerel had, had told me to call you. He's like, oh, well, you're the guy. He's like, yeah, yeah, Pete, you're Pete's guy. Come on in. Be there at 10. You know? Mm-hmm. So it's like I almost, di- I almost like didn't have the job. <laughs> and then I literally showed up uh, and got dropped off at a restaurant that had a line out the door at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. Holy shit. Because that's how Katz's was in right, those days. Right. From like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. we would have a line, you know? Yeah. And it was just, it was, talk about just getting thrown into like a boiling cauldron. You know, it was just like, <laughs> holy shit. There's like, a, uh, you know, it was the first time I like met gay people because it's yeah. a restaurant and half the people are gay. You know, right, right. they are or aren't. It's like the restaurant's such a like hyper-sexualized environment. Yeah. Very adult, very fast-paced, very intense, especially this place. Yeah. Very unprofessional. Were you, were, were you ready you know? to, to, to be oh, no, catapulted like, into that? I, I, I was like a character in a movie just getting thrown into something he wasn't ready for. Right. You know, but I like did it. You, know, you braced it, it out. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. It was so much fun. I, I took so naturally to it. So was it, it was four years in Austin and then three in Houston? Is that yeah. you said seven total, right? Yeah, Something like that. Seven years in- and then why'd you end up... You, so at some point you said... 
I need to make that voyage back into academia to finish up the degree. Was that, is yeah, that how wanted, that went or I did someone wanted, pressure you? Know, you? I, I, what I started to say about the restaurant business, like the restaurant business can really lift you up and I think it can also get you stuck. Yeah. And I think that it, cause it's an enabling business. Like sure. it enables people's bad habits. It enables you to like not save money. It enables, it's, you know, the restaurant business yeah. can do a lot of wonderful things for you, but you also have to be, be careful with it because mm-hmm. um, it is really easy to get stuck in a rut. You know, sure. that's why you see people who are, you know, have been working in the restaurant business for 30 years and don't have anything like to right. show for it. No, you know? no upward momentum in right. their careers. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause you can go out and party like a kid when you work in the restaurant business, you got a pocket full of cash, you know, you can go out drinking every night. No one sure. will ever judge you. Yeah. No one will, ever say why don't you put that in your savings account you know? <laughs> i don't know that anyone's ever said that to someone <laughs> in the restaurant industry. yeah and so have you heard of an ira right <laughs> yeah. yeah so like i mean that's something i hope to to help be, be a voice of change for now yeah uh, in the position i'm in right now is like more su- sustainable careers in the industry because mm-hmm. yeah you can do it forever until your body craps out on you and you oh, yeah. have carpal tunnel or some a bad back or right whatever. right this whole thing that i do now came out about sort of by accident just because I was working in the coffee business when I was in college. Yeah. I worked for a coffee roaster because my friend, my best friend at the time's parents owned a, the big local coffee roaster at the mm-hmm. time. And I went to work for them because <laughs> that was my buddy's family business and I needed right. a job and it was, I needed a job that could be flexible while I was a student. You know, right, right. I had to often leave during the day to go to class. But still involved with food again. And again, yeah, but like it. I was doing, like I did the farmer's market every Saturday. I did our booth at the farmer's market. Yeah, I did yeah. all of our charity stuff, like uh, Dolce Vita was there serving drinks. So that's always, that's a common, that's a thread. Yeah. Like like if I hadn't done what I did in the restaurant business, I wouldn't have done this job. Yeah, I have a feeling. now that's... I'm selling uh, locally roasted coffee to restaurants and bars. I, it was yeah. the same. It was just being a different. Different area, different, different side of different it. Different input into right. the same exactly. Uh, machine, exactly. you know. Um, and so I just did that for years. And it was while working for a different coffee roaster um, that I I started uh, the cocktail hobby at the time. Yeah. What? So, so what year are we talking? Oh five. Oh five. Okay. Yeah. Two thousand five. I met Joe, and he and I started getting into cocktails. Mm-hmm. Not quite by accident. We were both like, you know professionals and had yeah you've got some booze at home and had a lot of free time well and you it seems like you've got a background in being able to kind of taste flavors and things and things to think about a food or yeah we both have like an interest we both have like a culinary interest yeah exactly critical criticality like you can think about things critically and kind of dissect and joe bring you know i'm sure i don't know if he told you this when you talked to him but he brought he brings home this book from half price books just sort of on a on a flute Mm -hmm. and it was dale de groff's craft of the cocktail i don't think you mentioned and uh we had no idea who this guy was we started making all these drinks from it and then we sort of thought like well let's like let's get all the stuff you would need to like make all these drinks which turned out to be hundreds of of bottles (laughs) of booze there's like 500 recipes in that book um and then we happened to look him up on the internet and Mm -hmm. see like who is this guy and we're like, oh, he's gonna be talking at this little conference in New Orleans. Oh, cool! And that was, uh, and that was 2007. And uh, we go to this little conference, and it's freaking Tales of the Cocktail. And was that? It was, it, it was how, the fifth anniversary. The fifth, okay. It was the fifth Tales of the Cocktail. It was my first. It, it, I think that I think that's right. They were celebrating right. their fifth anniversary. And uh, now, now, and my mind was blown because I thought it was so huge. Right. It was a fraction of the size. Sure, that, sure. You know, South or uh, you know, tales of the cocktail in two thousand seven was like South by in the nineties compared yeah, to what, what it is both now. Of those events are today. I mean, yeah. tales of the cocktail has, has she's done an enormous job with that event. It's right. It's sort of like the envy of the world as far as I'm concerned. Oh for, yeah, yeah. The, the it's a world events. class. It is event, a huge you know? thing, and people can say whatever they want about that event. I'm like, you're still gonna go. Sure, <laughs> it's like have, CES, right? Yeah. For for tech in a sense, it's that's the place where ideas proliferate that's a place that things are announced that's kind of the the launching point for so many careers so many spirits it's insane how influential it is. and now and now whatever 13 years strong or however whatever year year they're on you know it's a behemoth it's a it is a it is the big deal and yeah it was then and it's still it was the only deal then right and it's still the big deal and i and i so now we've been to nine tales this now (laughs) jesus man that was our first tales and now we've been to nine of them uh so this this year will be our 10th tales wow um but anyway, we so you know that that was so so eye opening. Meeting all these people, I met people like I met I met uh, uh, this, uh, Jordan Silbert who mm-hmm. had just started this like little little soda soda water company uh, called Q 
Q tonic. Oh yeah. And yeah. he had like just these one, he had one size, one product, uh-huh. one flavor for a while. We distributed it for him out of our garage. No like, shit. He, he shipped us a pallet and we would drive Q tonic around to like, you know, the five places that cared about artisanal tonic in mm-hmm. those days. Fino, um, Starlight downtown. Oh, I remember. Yeah, Craven, yeah, I remember that. Starlight. I mean, it seems like ancient history now. Oh, it totally but, uh, does. That's how that that's how crazy shit was in those days. And I'm sure, like when you talk to Bill Norris or anyone who was trying to do this back in those days, you know, we would like order order Luxardo Maraschino on the internet and like right bring, bring it into events or people who worked in bars would bring it in in like a Dasher bottle or whatever mm-hmm. unmarked because you couldn't get like a proper tax stamp bottle of, it's of so st- maraschino from absolutely from, right from twin you know? yeah and uh because none of that shit was distributed here yet and yeah john garrett man i gotta give him a lot of credit for bringing John that is, stuff john's in. had a huge uh piece of that yeah. yeah uh you know i remember i remember hosting uh uh what's his name eric uh, Al- uh eric seed, seed from, from uh, House uh, House Alpins. House i remember yeah. we hosted him at the usbg like you know in 2008 or right. something i remember getting a call from uh the people at Sp- uh, Spirit with the Southwest Airlines magazine, uh-huh, uh-huh. The, the photo studio here, uh, Voorhees, Adam Voorhees, uh, who shoots all that stuff, really uh-huh. well known photographer yeah. in town. His studio called me because they were shooting a cocktail for the magazine, and there was not a bottle of of uh, of uh, Creme de Violette in Austin. Oh but no! They sh- I, but they knew I had one, <laughs> so so they're shooting this for a national magazine. But they couldn't go to the store and buy creme de violet because <laughs> it didn't exist in those days. Would you? But would you? Uh, did called, you ask for anything? Like nah, in return? No, no. I just, you know, dropped off the bottle. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's it was like this frontier. It yeah, had this Sort yeah. of like Wild West feel to it. It's amazing. Like smuggling. I remember one year for my birthday, Joe gave me a suitcase uh, full of Saint Germain. Uh-huh. Like I thought when I unwrapped, I was like, oh, I got a suitcase. He's like, open it. I'm like, whoa, all the Saint Germain. <laughs> Because in those days, like Saint Germain, you couldn't get locally. You had yeah, to, like smuggle it in. That's so. That's uh, crazy. You know, it, it was. And then, of course, like years later, I ended up working for the brand. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, in those days, it was like it felt. It was very cool because, like, we you know we we all met each other like on the internet or like my blog. I met right. I met people like Larry Nixon, Bill Norris. Yeah. So some of those early characters, I met them through like comments on my own blog so you so the blog was the first vehicle for you to what talk about recipes or talk about ingredients or was it a combination of both in those days uh it was G- geo cities days yeah in those days we were talking <laughs> about like uh cocktails we'd had at people's places uh-huh. products you know in those days it was like every i felt like every week or two some, something new was coming to town that we couldn't previously get yeah, yeah so there was a lot of talk about that i wish i wish i had my archives still up though our site's not down is oh down, no down right now but when I used to go back and read that shit, it sort of made me laugh because uh-huh. because things that we would get so excited about those in those days, like orange bitters, you know, right? Oh, right. I remember the first time I got orange. Now bitters. you get them at HEB. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And so uh, the other, but then the other thing. So the other thing that the other thing that was was on TipsyTexan.com in those days was my uh, I call it the Dale David Project. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the uh, Julie Julia Project. From, uh-huh. uh, Julie Powell, I think is her name from Austin. Uh, cooked cooked everything in the Julia Child's mastering art of French cooking. Oh man, you know she, you know, which is such an ordeal. I mean, Absolutely, such an incredible, yeah. massive undertaking. And she she launched her whole career. You know, she's she, there's been a movie made about it and all this stuff. You know, she's wow. a major character now. Um, the uh, um, but you're doing oh, the same so, thing. So with my Dale, my right? idea was like I'm gonna I'm gonna mix every drink in Dale DeGroff's uh, craft of the cocktail. Oh, wow, and about at 125. You know, I think we made it through 125. Uh huh blog posts and re- I mean it's a it's a, it's a lot a man. massive undertaking yeah. in and of itself uh but by that point I was so busy like making cocktails in the real world mm-hmm. because we got started getting brand work and event work and people would ask us so to, so to, to help to, with menus to so frame like, it for a second though so tipsy Texan then started from kind of this academic pursuit in a blog doing recipes reviewing cocktails discussions but it turned into something larger well like, we started um we started making drinks at events like um uh, galas, fundraisers, banquets, right. art museum things, gallery openings. We started doing that stuff. We started doing um, an event called that we called Art of the Cocktail. You know, very uh, <laughs> yeah. high tone. Uh, now I realize we were doing a pop up. You know, we t- we yeah. used to take over the bar at Z Tejas on Sixth Street on Sunday nights. Oh, really? They had this annex um, that they didn't use in the in the in the winter. It was mm. like a, it was kind of their patio bar and waiting area in the summer because mm. people would like get off their boats and come in and like wait and have a margarita and then go and eat. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I I met Jack Gilmore. It was back when he was still like cooked there. You know, uh-huh. He was like people forget like he was not just like the 
corporate chef. He was that too, but he actually like be there cooking. Wow. Um, as Iteos just not that long ago, you know? Oh yeah. That's, that's yeah, seven, it's not eight, that long. Seven, eight years ago. And, um, Jack was like, we, you know, we were just like, yeah, let's do something. He's like, yeah, I got this building that we never use in the fall. Cause it's like our outdoor bar, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we just got like a jazz band. They had a jazz band that would play. And Joe and I would make, I look back on it now. It seems so silly. We were making like sidecars, uh, you know, <laughs> Julep, Sazerac, you know, just classic mm-hmm. mostly. But like at a time we're talking like, you know, at a time uh, where there were no cocktail bars in town. You no, know, there, right, there, right. there may have been like Peche opening around that time. Um, but there wasn't, there just wasn't that much going on. Right. You know, Peche, you said Sherm, Fino, that's about, it was about it. You yeah. Know, that's for, pretty for, slim for that type of cocktail. Um, there weren't that many places in town where you could walk in and get a Sazerac. Right. Right. So we were doing, you know, now, now, now people do this. It is a thing now. And people do this yeah. all the time. And you get it like, like Applebee's. No big, well, no, but also I mean like pop-ups. People, oh, gotcha. Gotcha. People okay. know what that is now. And I didn't learn that term until years after we had been doing it. I had it. been doing <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we did stuff like that. And it was just through that kind of exposure. You have to think it's sort of like big fish, small pond syndrome. You know, yeah. we weren't really doing anything like so, so remarkable. But it's since you're in Austin. It's just that I was in Austin and there wasn't very many other people doing that type of thing. Right. Like right. Norris, uh, you, know, you know, people that you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who are still around. Well, it's still just a part. few. Of, it has to start somewhere. Yeah. Right. It's got to take a few. Even if it's been done in New York for, for years, it still has to happen somewhere. Someone's yeah. got to start it. You know, they've got to ignite that. So you guys were there. Would you consider, was that maybe, what was the, the appropriate term? Is it a consult, consulting group? Is it Yeah, just we a, were a doing consulting group? stuff, you know, and, and, and uh, helping people with menus. And, you know, we did, we did a lot of event work and a lot of, we did a ton of, we did a ton of, like, parties and weddings, that, you know, things yeah. like that. I would do, like, classes for, like, law, stu- law school students who were about to graduate in the real world. Right. I would, like, do, like, a, here's how to order Manhattans and martinis and Drink like an adult. You know, yeah. drink, drink like a person who's about to make six figures. Right. Who's right. been drinking Keystone Light for the last three years. <laughs> Time to step you know? it up. Yeah. Like I would do that kind of class. You know, just, I don't know. It was just, it was always a hodgepodge thing. Yeah. But in those days, I still had my coffee job. Um, and I, and I did until 2009. I finally like quit and jumped into tipsy full time. So when was um, the, what, how, what was the impetus of saying, okay, we've got all this knowledge and kind of building. So you're getting practical knowledge because you're making the cocktails. You're writing about them on your blog, at least. And when did you think that? And, and in taking... edible, edible, edible Austin was a real early voice for. Oh, really? Not just us and cocktails, but like you know, people take it for granted now that all these places like you know Barley Swine, uh-huh. all these kind of like I hate to say it, but farm to plate. Sure, that, sure. You know, that that sort of like whole natural foods type restaurant. Mm-hmm. That you know people take that for granted, but edible Austin. Marla Camp uh, and Jen Jenna Noel, yeah, enormous force for the for this movement in in te- in Austin, you know, in Central Texas. In terms of like uh, a journalist promoting kind of farmers markets, promoting growers, promoting producers, uh, you know, promoting you know pr- promoting distilled spirits in Texas. You know, I, oh, I had yeah. a, I had a meeting about official drink of Austin today. Um, we, when you look back, it, it, you know, it's two thousand eight, I think was the first year we did drink local night. Uh-huh. Two thousand seven, two thousand eight somewhere around then there were like five distilleries in texas right you know oh, the no, first, like 60 the first the first drink local night was like an illegal event in the courtyard of gueros like that uh-huh. like, that patio next to it right uh, it got sort of rained out if i recall correctly and it was like you know tito's paula's dripping springs balcon not balconies they weren't out yet it, it was next yeah, to, it was, much like it, it was just like barely anything. Right. And then the next year uh, we did it in like, uh, in like a swanky condo tower downtown. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was like, and like people, it was hot, you know, it was cool, man. People, and like Bobby Hugel came and competed and Bill competed and Ben Craven and Lara Nixon, like yeah, all wow. these people who were like the big cocktail people of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Were like, I mean, like, can you picture Bobby Hugel shaking cocktails in a cocktail competition? <laughs> like, that's not, you know, he's like a, a mogul. Right, like an icon co- now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's like more in the thought leader class now. <laughs> yeah. uh, he was then, too. In fact, when I had my blog, the only other blog in Texas about drinks was Bobby's. Oh, yeah. Uh, he had a blog called uh, Explore the Poor. <laughs> and he, you know. But he not did, like the poor people without money, right? P-O-U-R. Not that, okay, okay. I'm just and uh, sure. he worked at a restaurant called... Um, it was a little barbecue restaurant in, uh-huh. uh, in Houston, and uh, and that was like the that was sort of like the fino of Austin. Right. That was the place where if you knew if you want to know about cocktails, you would go see Bobby Kevin mm-hmm. Floyd, you know his business partner, uh-huh. uh, 
it's still like he where he worked there and it was like he was making he was making the brave like his yeah like the brave. signature cocktail way back then in like really seven two thousand he was making a, a version of it um way back in those days yeah you know i didn't realize i re- i was at his bar um the night that morgan um who was one of his business partners at uh-huh. the time or became his business partner in anvil um morgan shows up with the keys for this bar that they got uh-huh the the lease on you know yeah it, right. which became anvil which Holy is like shit. the mothership of te- texas cocktails yeah you know? yeah uh, now it's like generations of bartenders have passed through that it's, and i remember getting in the car uh and going over there with morgan and like walking through this like horrible blue sticky former daiquiri <laughs> factory uh with it that still had a dj booth hanging from the ceiling oh jesus you know and then uh, it just you know <laughs> years months later like becoming a mecca a cocktail mecca for for yeah. the u.s but also yeah. i mean obviously for texas it's the place yeah, you know. and things were just things were just so small in those days. You know, you have to remember that Bobby and those guys had never even been to a cocktail bar when they built Anvil. Really? Everything they knew about cocktails was from their own experience, like mm-hmm. from just working in working in bars, but like you know, nightclubs and restaurants. Right, not, right. Not you know, they had never stepped into anything like a PDT or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's really it, it's it's a distinct type of bar. Like when you go to those bars in Houston, because their DNA strand is coming from something. That had its own like its own point of origin, yeah. you know, and it was like a it had its own genesis. It wasn't it's like so cool. It's it so wasn't cool. like a Sasha Petrosky bar, right? Like right, you right. see all over New York or L.A. or even Austin. Now. Yeah, yeah. It was its own thing. Like there's distinct ways of doing things and the ways of building bars that you'll see people do in Houston. That's very an- Anvilian, uh, Anvilian, or, or Hug- <laughs> Hugelian, or whatever uh, that you don't see outside of that area. Or it's or a- if you do, it's because we were friends and we consulted on something and, and they saw it at anvil or whatever. yeah like we had stuff at esquire tavern that like we went down in a car at esquire to when we were opening esquire uh-huh. me and Jarrett and chris hill and our crew like we went to anvil and we're like poking behind the bar with those guys yeah and they're giving us the tour and showing how they built everything mm-hmm. and so we copied a lot of that stuff when we built esquire and there's other bars around that's so cool that i didn't realize using that, that technology the, the, that's the the, D, uh, the dna of maybe the cocktail aesthetic in in, in texas yeah it, it really is so when did you start doing the classes then it seems like a nice evolution of the brand um lara nixon and i partnered on that and i think uh 2010 mm-hmm. i think the fall of 2010 was the first uh tipsy tech tipsy tech it was called tipsy that- tech the uh, history and practice of cocktail mixing. That was like the dating scene for cocktail of people at that point. Oh like, my god! I look back I mean? at it and I look back at it now, and I'm like, I wish I, had, I wish I could remember like all. I wish I had like pictures of it. Cause yeah. You look at all the folks. I mean, it's like Jason Stevens, Josh Loving, uh, the Sanders is right. Like, all right. these folks Emma. that are mm-hmm. that are part of our scene uh, that a lot of us met or became friends uh, through that. Yeah. It was like it's like I've never owned a bar or opened one, mm-hmm. but it's like I've had these moments where like that was my bar. Yeah, <laughs> like Tipsy Tech regular. Tuesday nights at at Twin for like several years. Yeah, that, it's like that's the closest thing I've probably ever had to. That's so bar, cool. You know? And it, it became, people could like come see us and hang out and do stuff. Yeah, and talk and chat and learn. And it was a launching point for many careers, but it served in in a sense it was like those were the cadets that you were sending off the bat not even intentionally right but just they were inspired in that sense and like they went and they started all this stuff like if you just traced it like yeah you i mean said, i'm not saying like that was certainly not ever our, no of course not of course our not. agenda or whatever but it ended up being it like it was that. just like it just happened like we we were doing a cool thing and it attracted some cool people yeah um a lot of whom have gone on to like do really big Absolutely. Or and a lot of them were do, were already doing big things. It's just there was not nothing that big in those days. Right. You know, we only had a couple of cocktail bars. We had Peche and Eastside Showroom and not much else. Right. Back it's a, when you when you started working, was your first official brand gig with Saint Germain? Yeah, I got just... a call. Um, I think it was. Um, uh, it was. I think it was in 2011. Yeah. I got a phone call from uh, Brian Townsend. Oh, okay. who's now one of the main partners in uh 86 company mm-hmm. um, he's like there runs all their sales i think internationally yeah brian um called me because i was the usbg president at the time uh-huh. um and i i got this i got some version of this call on a really regular basis for for a couple of years it seems uh, someone would call me and be like oh we're trying to find someone in austin or in central texas to right. do like some bartender ambassador brand type brand work you mm-hmm. know um you know, they need to visit this many accounts and we got a couple hundred bucks for them and this is what their thing is. And do, you, yeah. do you know anybody? Right, right, right. And I would get that call all the time. 
because uh, I, I became like a you're like, like a head I was hunter like kind of clearinghouse yeah know, <laughs> bartender contacts you know yeah. and the, and uh and uh I hung up the phone. I told him, like, yeah, let me think about it. And I called him immediately back. I was like, actually, I want that job. Like, yeah. That's my job. Amazing. I, I love that brand. And I wanted, like, I remember. I've got when, a when, suitcase of it. When I got hired for that brand, when I first went up to New York for, like, training, I told the guy who's, like, this guy, Peter, who sort of run, sort of runs the company. Like, he's the executive assistant to uh-huh. the owner. Um, I told Peter, I said, I said, you know, I emailed you several years ago saying that if uh, if you ever wanted to hire someone in Texas, I would love to do it. And you did not email me. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? And I, I, showed, I went back through like my Gmail and showed him yeah. his email that it was like, to whom it may concern. <laughs> you know, you know, at, you know, info at St. Germain. Right, right, right. I just sent this like totally blind <laughs> cold call email to them saying that I want to work for him. I think that's probably the only cold call job I've ever not, you know, not applied. <laughs> but for. it worked out ironically. Yeah, indirectly years later. So yeah, I got I got I got hired to be their sort of like bartender ambassador. Mm. And we had a blast. You know, that was a, such a fun brand to work on. It was before it was in the days before it had become so well known. So, yeah. and, and it's a delicious substance. Oh, yeah. Like you know, you pour in some champagne and give it to someone, you have to kind of be an asshole not to like the flavor of it's it. It's ambrosial. You know? And um and it and it and it, you know you have to think it because now I think people think it's sort of like played out maybe but uh, right in those days it was so so cool and uh, you know Rob Cooper is just a marketing genius like his his aesthetic his marketing prowess is, mm-hmm. is just unparalleled and um and you know he's been handsomely rewarded for it like absolutely he's, man he's had, he's had enormous success in his life and whatever you know five years in he's able to sell this brand that he had pulled out of his out of his head or thin air. Yeah. And then now it's a several hundred thousand a year case brand. Yeah. It's crazy. And he sells it to Bacardi. I mean, it's one of the biggest success stories in modern spirits history. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I feel really privileged to have been, to have been able to be like on the front line of watching that happen. Yeah. I remember we didn't know it at the time, but um, you know, watching the ramp up of going from like this like small company with a few people working on it to like 40 mm. something salespeople, bartender wow. ambassadors and you know, and all the, you know, just being this national organization. Right, right. And then an acquisition, you know, it's a, it was a big, it was a big moment. Did you, uh, did you benefit at all from the acquisition financially? Oh, I mean, I was such a, I was so low on the totem pole. I was, you know, a part-time bartender ambassador. Yeah. But yeah, we all got, he was, you know, he gave us all a little something, a little something. something. That's cool. That's really nice. Um, and then I, and then actually I stayed on. So for nine months, we actually worked for Bacardi. You know, he Bacardi yeah. hired Cooper Spirits to run the brand. Oh, no kidding! On their behalf, while until they, started, they were tr- figuring yeah, it out. You, yeah. you're t- it's such a major ordeal. You've got manufacturing processes, input, sourcing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, raw materials. All that stuff has to get transitioned. You've got warehouses full of you know supplies and mm-hmm. POS, and you've got all the like uh, all the uh, administrative architecture has to get shifted over. Like selling a brand, it is not as easy as you know, it's not just you write a check somebody and writes then, a check and yeah. it gets cash you know there even i mean i don't know the, the specific terms of the deal but it was when you're when you're writing a check in the in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars right. lawyer, lawyers have to get involved i mean you've got to figure yeah, out you don't even just, just how to like transfer that money and where does it go you exactly, know? Like that's, exactly that's such a huge process like everything about it is very complicated um so i worked on it for Bacardi for nine months, and then I went back to Cooper Spirits. And what is the is so Eli Gallus Cooper? So slow I was, and low. I, w- I worked for the company when we had um, when we uh, made Slow and Low, Lock, Stock and Barrel, uh, the liqueur Creme Vet, and then, Creme Vet, and then okay. we became the importer and distributor for uh, excuse me, imp- importer and representation for Eli Gallus. Okay, okay. So Cooper doesn't own that brand, but but they import it. John Rexor, I believe. Gotcha. Okay. And so at, at some point, Tipsy Texans, seemingly, you guys are still doing the classes because those only ended within the past few years, right? You guys were still doing that while you were working with St. Germain. Yeah, I think I think um, fall of 2013 was my last semester that I did. Yeah. At one point, we were doing Monday nights in San Antonio and Tuesday nights in Austin. Oh, shit, I didn't And know it that. was just, you know, for 10 weeks straight. That's a lot, just, man. It was, a, it was an, quite an ordeal. Yeah. Because, you know, we got we got bigger and bigger with it every semester. We were like... You know, we wouldn't just do a class on Scotch and Irish whiskey. I would bring racks of antique Irish coffee glasses to demonstrate the Irish coffee right, cocktail. Right, right. And <laughs> excuse me, and you would drink it out of an actual Irish coffee glass. Or like yeah. every week had like some complication to it. 
You just um, had to make it like over the top and wonderful experience. Difficult. Yeah. Um, but eventually it just, it, we've never, like we've never officially stopped doing it. We just, it's just, you just never, and it's on hiatus. It's, on hiatus. it's like LCD <laughs> sound system. <laughs> yeah. They never really broke up. Right. Yeah. They, they just have come not back. broken up the band. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. I think yeah. we're all kind of like bracing ourselves. Like, when is it going to come back? What are they going to release what, a new the record? Problem, the challenge with, here's the challenge with tipsy tech. And this is the reason why, like I, I've, I have a lot of pride around tipsy tech. Mm. It, it is, it is one of the most comprehensive cocktail and spirits education programs that I've ever seen. Yeah. And I'm, and I like, I would sign up for one if somebody else was doing it. Sure. Like, I would love for someone to tell me, find me because we used to do it for 12 weeks it was originally a 12 week program okay um where we would literally do a deep dive on every major spirits category uh we demonstrated and tasted classic and modern versions of every spirit wow uh we had an exam at the end Mm -hmm. like a 50 question written exam uh we had uh, a practical exam where Uh you would have to like come and make we would give you the cocktail book at the beginning of the semester and uh you would have by the end of the semester you know, so we would, we would demonstrate like two two or three cocktails every week, yeah. and at the end of the semester, there were that was like a bank of like thirty cocktails that you had to that that you would come. Me and Lara would do this at like her house or my house, home mm-hmm. bar. You know, they would come and have to demonstrate their cocktail, and they couldn't use like it was not open book. You, I would be like, okay, uh, Michael, I uh, you're going to make uh, me a a sidecar and a gimlet, yeah, um, and she's gonna have you know whatever an Irish coffee. And you would just have to make those, which wow. you know, when you're talking about people who like work in offices or, or like that's, this, a, that's we, profound. We yeah. were doing, I think, a better education program for like consumers. Yeah, or a lot of a lot of trade people, you know, came through. Sure, I just remembered uh, Ben Edgerton, the owner of Contigo. Uh-huh. He, he did our program. I just no this, shit. I just had this image of him shaking cocktails in my in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, all kinds of, I mean, just that's tons incredible. Of folks, tons of folks came. Seems like it was a lot of Pam fun. from the Tiger, Pam, right? Mm-hmm. Know, a bunch of folks. Um, and so we were like, you know, it was it was sort of modeled on bar smarts, you know, yeah, like from yeah. way back when. Like right. My memory of bar smarts, you know, uh, where you had this like blind book of cocktails you had to memorize and you got to test it live. live. Right. I mean, there's nothing like that in Texas. You know? No, I, I don't not. think there's anything like it. Not in, even nationally. In there's most not places really. in, yeah. the, in the country. I can't think of a program that's as comprehensive as what right. we're doing. It, with the exception, like, yeah, now bar. Well, it's different. Yeah. Is by far like that's the gold standard, but yeah. it's also like you know fifteen hundred bucks. Right, it's so a lot of money. Get, you have to get accepted. You have to put yourself in New York for a week, and like mm-hmm. that's a, that, like I would do that program. I think I would love to do bar. That's like such such a cool thing. Everyone yeah, oh, yeah. I know who's done it has said it was life changing. Sure. So with the exception of that, you know, I think we were doing well. There's everybody else. It's like yeah. it's not cost prohibitive, right? Yeah. It's accessible for people in Texas. Yeah, it was you know three hundred fifty bucks or yeah, something, which is not. In and, comparisons and, and so and so what the way we did it because you can't like like you, you'll you'll the reason why that this doesn't exist in most of the country is that the liquor laws make it very difficult right so yeah. like i went to acc culinary i got i've been invited a number of times to to speak there as like an alumnus mm-hmm. um the first time i went to speak on spirits i show up with like all these tools and a box of books like mm-hmm, antique mm-hmm. books and like a crate full of liquor and start setting up my station my my podium you know yeah and they're like what are you doing i was like i'm gonna make some cocktails you know they're like no you're not I'm like what are you talking about and they're like well you can't bring liquor into this onto this campus you know this is like because they have a beer and wine permit oh in the thing, okay okay in the cafe and it's like against the law to bring you know just like you can't Bring right. liquor into a bar, a beer, you know, the Horseshoe Lounge or whatever. Or yeah, maybe, yeah. I don't know. You, or you can, but you can't sell it. Right. You, know, you right. could do a, go to a setups bar, but you can't start selling it. Yeah. And because of our archaic rules, since they're paying for class, I can't therefore serve them samples of old fashions. Right. Because it's like I'm selling the, you know, and the right exactly like, the like part of the TBC, money. And I get it. Like it's a, it is a, it, it is t- like against the law. Yeah. The law is written dumbly for that. Like, <laughs> there should be an education permit. Like I think that that's, if I could have it, a legislative agenda, yeah. it would be that there needs to be an education license because it's cost prohibitive to own a mixed beverage permit. Oh yeah. But the only way to do, <clears throat> the only way to do hands on cocktail, uh, education, uh, education, yeah, curriculum where people can taste and all that stuff is, mm-hmm. is really with a mixed beverage permit. And that adds such a layer of complexity to sure. it. Cause like, I'm not, trying to make money off of i'm not trying to make money off these drinks right I'm charging for the education yeah but if i have to pay taxes like on that bottle which ha- which is going to get dumped down the drain right it's not like you're trying to, it's not about testing. money the 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 tax structure for 
what I'm talking about doesn't make sense. Yeah. The tax structure for mixed beverage permits doesn't make sense when you're doing it for education. Right, right. Uh, and, and you can't use donated product if you're in a licensed premises know, and all this stuff. It's very strange. So we found an interesting, like working with uh, with the, the folks from Twin, yeah. we, we, we found a way, and we like literally sat at the desk with TBC and mm-hmm. worked out this kind of complex arrangement where what we were doing at Tipsy Tech was following the tasting guidelines, which, oh, we, which you know from yeah, your business. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can do a tasting at a liquor store. Sure. So, and there's rules around that. You have to have a tasting permit. Um, someone from you either have to have a marketing permit or be an employee of the store to serve it. Right, right. Uh, there's a restriction on the amount you can serve. Yep. You can't charge for the service. So, like we we served. So so we so we were charging for the class, but we charged independently for that yeah so people would pay us for the class but we would conduct the class like a tasting i see so it was totally kosher yeah but like there couldn't be hands-on there were just things we couldn't do like, yeah we it's couldn't incredibly do full-size cocktails uh, people couldn't do hands-on um you know but we 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 and think like twin was an enormous supporter right um with us on this and 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 i'm really i'm really thankful to them for because yeah. they sort of you know went out on a limb to to, to make to, it happen, to work with TBC to yeah. find to find a way to do this um, within what is a very limiting law. You know, mm-hmm. the law by design is is very limiting, and so we were able to to work with TBC and find a way to do it legally in the store, um, operating it basically as a giant <laughs> taste, as a giant tasting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had to keep a list at the door. We could we couldn't come in. Uh, we could we, people who hadn't paid for the class couldn't come into the tasting, right? But right. since we weren't charging, since we're charging for the education, we couldn't tell them they couldn't have the sample. Yeah. So if someone knew that, they could just like come stand out the door and want and sample. We'd have to like <laughs> hand, hand them all the samples. Right. Like, every right. Blue moon. Yeah, it's would, so strange. Every blue moon that would happen, but you know, um, it was it was cool. It was a fun run. I think we did uh, seven full semesters of That's it. That's insane. That's no one outside of New York's really been able to do that. Yeah. In that kind of capacity, in that kind of breadth, yeah. in that kind of scope, yeah. so you got to be pretty proud of that. No, it's cool. It's cool. It, it'll it will come back again someday. Yeah. Um. I just think we'll probably have to do it. Um. You know, in a in a proper bar setting, right, it's going right. to cost a lot more money to do it. Mm-hmm. Um. But it, Kickstarter, man. It was fun. It was fun while it lasted, and um, and it, and you know, we made a ton of friends, a ton of friends doing it. Yeah. And when I look back through like old emails and stuff, I'm like, I can't believe that guy was in our thing. You know, <laughs> it was really, it was, a, it was how, like, those were good days. How did that turn into a, a book deal in that book experience? Was that after the classes had already kind of been underway? Yeah, for sure. In fact, my book agent, my literary agent's uh, man was in the, who took my class. I'm oh, no like, kidding. Okay. People, like, he took my class. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the book thing came about. I was out in Marfa, um, doing making cocktails. We were doing a pop up at this mm. at this restaurant called the Blue Havelina uh-huh. that a friend of mine owned um, in an old Texaco station. Really cool, like modern cuisine. Is this still around? No, the building is, um, but he has rented it to somebody else. I see. Okay. Um, the BJ, we call it the BJ. The BJ. Um, he it was such a cool place. He had a condo in the back, so we would do oh, like, man. Uh, Camp BJ and um, <laughs> Camp BJ. <laughs> Like Rebecca Rather, the chef from Fredericksburg, she would come out. Uh, we would come out. I, I, you know, I would get like a truckload of booze from like mm. friends at Bacardi or wherever, and uh, just drive out to West Texas uh, and do because it was a, it was a, his his restaurant ha- had a bar but no liquor permit. Was, oh, it was, it was, cool! So it was cool. amazing. Like we yeah, could, we could stock an entire back bar full of donated product and give away cocktails. That's amazing. And make you know eight hundred dollars in tips because right we're, people are out there in the middle of nowhere. You know how isolated Marfa is. Yeah, and get like a perfectly uh, stirred martini or whatever. Absolutely for, for free. Yeah, you know people would just like be so generous. They, they love it. Yeah, and had such a good time because they're out there for like the film fest or you know any of the art festivals. Right, Marfa. right. You know we did that quite a few times back in those days, and I think I had some articles out on the bar. And a woman uh, named Martha Hopkins, who has done book deals for a lot of prominent people uh-huh. in town, um, she she's an author and a cookbook publisher or cookbook writer and right, right. and uh, and literary agent. And she just asked me, "Have you ever done a, thought about doing a book deal or doing a, a cocktail book?" And I and I was like, "Yeah, it's something I would love to do, um, but I just you know I don't know how to do it." And she's like, "Well, I, you know, I, I have a I have a best selling book, and yeah. I, and I help people get book deals. Like I'm an agent." You wow. Know? 
and she just became a good friend and a and a and a, and yeah, she got us the deal. You know, how was that experience kind of constructing? Was it really arduous? Uh, writing a cocktail book is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's um, it's something that it's something that like you talked like I, you know Re- Rebecca Rather is a friend of mine and she's got three books out mm-hmm. and she, you know she told me I remember like you know on book two or three she was like you know it's like you do this thing and it's incredibly difficult uh-huh. and about the time that the pain of the last time wears off uh-huh. uh, you start thinking man I want to do another book and then, and then when you're in the middle of it you're like Jesus what was I thinking what the fuck and, and I so thinking? I'm actually in that process right now oh really we're, you're working on number we're, two we're, we're working on number two amazing and uh and it is. It's because it's because two years have passed since it came out. Uh-huh. Um, another year passed. You know, so it's like three years since we we were really in the thick of it. Yeah. And the and I forgot how grueling that that was. You know, but um, it's a it's a it's a very rewarding process for me. Writing um, is something I love having done. I don't necessarily love doing it. Yeah. But I love the finished product. Yeah, it's a I beautiful love, book. I love when I look at something like I, I did so much research and you know, my book was fact checked by like three different people uh-huh. and the recipes were all tested two or three times each. Um, it was like, I, I, like I, I still like, I found a few when we did the second printing, I made like tiny changes, uh-huh. but I couldn't really find anything that I thought was like a, an egregious like error. In, right. In, right, in right. It. There are a few things that I just learned that I got wrong maybe a little bit, but nothing like, um, in the construction of the recipes, or there's no. So like, you really... did lots of due diligence, lots of research, and you made sure it was bold. Yeah, and I ran it by people, and I still like to this day. I would love for someone to tell me like, "Hey, I saw this in your book. It's not right." Because that way, hopefully, we'll you know get a third printing. And right, I can fix right. It. I can fix it. You know, same kind of um, concept for the second installment. Uh, it's in this. I'm, I'm picturing them all ultimately being like in a series. Like yeah. I love the size of the book. I love. I do too. It Color opens, design, it opens so. easily. It lays flat on the counter. Right. Um, it's inexpensive, you know, they're 20, less than 20 bucks yeah, to yeah. buy. Um, so, so can I say this one thing? So I've got some books downstairs. I'm not a heavy reader, but I do have a, a small collection of cocktail books. You're the only person that's written a book that I've owned. So this is a, an amazing... So in other words, I don't know any of those other authors of those books. Oh, oh right. Got Mirakami? It. I don't fucking... You know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Hemingway's dead. So I don't uh, have... I, there's not a lot, a lot of likelihood that right. I'm going to ever meet an author. So... That's kind of a, a cool thing, man, because yeah. you're incredibly accessible to the industry and to people, but yeah. you're really, really transparent, and you've done some fucking amazing things, and you're just people, um, chatting with me. I, I, lo- I, I, I love the, that process, and I love having the book. The book is a really good, like, you know, you don't make any money on cocktail books. Right. Um, I think, you know, even like my agent told me, she's like, look, when you write your first book, you're sort of just trying to get to the second book. Yeah, yeah. So you got to nail it. You got to do a really good job. And then hopefully you'll get more money on the, <laughs> second, on the second deal. Because yeah. the industry is crazy. Like, it, it is such a volatile industry. Right. Um, it's it's not something that, uh, it's not. So they actually, the cookbook and cocktail book segment of the industry uh-huh. is actually strong. Like, people are buying cookbooks more strongly i guess than not that not that they're buying more books right, right, right than right. they are novels but the deal with like a novel translates so well to like an electronic device yes yeah uh, you know i fly a lot and reading you know you know you look down a plane and you'll see like 20 people sitting there reading an electronic book oh absolutely but like i have the electronic edition of tipsy texan and uh-huh. i've never used it in my kitchen but mm. we have two beat up copies of it of the book, and those you'll use uh, all the time. That we use all the time. I carry one in my backpack, and one's on the bar at home. Yeah, I reference it all the time because I we did all. I can't remember anything, you know. <laughs> or I can't remember everything. I should say. So, but I, I use it as a piece of reference all the time. Yeah, for like dates or recipes or whatever. Because I already checked. I already fact checked it. Back you know, back. it's good. Like I know, I know it's accurate. Some so, good notes. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually use it as my own personal reference manual a lot when I'm doing stuff for work right. or working on an article or whatever. Does, do, you, do you have time? And I think this is something that, that's really important. You really, have, you and Joe have done a lot and you are traveling a whole lot. You have stepped into what is essentially a new career, which we'll talk about in a second. It's still, you know, sure. parallel to, to what you're doing. Do you ever look back? Do you, do you ever take some time to reflect and think, you know, I, in some sense, created some little legacy here in Texas? You I know, mean, and, and let me yeah. debit legacy. You don't have to call it that, but yeah. like, do you, do you get that time to sit back and kind of reflect and respect the stuff that you've done? I mean, here's the thing: 
everything we do, like the ground is moving under our feet in this right. industry. It's such it's such a dynamic time to be in this business. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many new faces. You know, I went to the uh, USBG holiday party the other day. And yeah, I didn't recognize like a third of the yeah, people there. Yeah, me either. And I'm like, I I was the first in the first officer group of this thing. Like, right, I right. helped like sign the petition when we started this chapter back when you knew if you were a cocktail person, you not only knew everybody like around in town, you knew everyone in like Houston and Dallas, right? And San Antonio, absolutely, because there were so few of us. And and you know, a testament to how like cool all this is is that there's so many people, like so many young faces. Yeah, that I'm so excited. I'm so excited about that. Like, I I don't have um any like regrets or hesitations because i see like what's happening in our business mm-hmm. like we're, we got in at the right time to to be on the ground floor of something in texas right. um that's now like a big thing now nobody takes nobody like uh people take t- people take it for granted that we've got like you know this this next week is the fifth anniversary of san antonio cocktail yeah Conference. it's incredible i remember when they were like People huffing and puffing about why it wasn't why the, with the first year. How come it's not going to be in Austin? You know, it's like yeah, because we didn't we didn't get our asses in gear right. to do it. But yeah, they yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that they've done it and they've done an awesome job, and I've spoken at it every year, and I'm a big supporter of it. Yeah, I'm so glad that they did it down there because because then we don't have to do it. You yeah, know, like, they're no, doing absolutely. all the heavy lifting, and we just get to go hang out and like throw parties and <laughs> go to classes. Like we get to reap their benefits. We get to reap the yeah. benefits. Like that crew in San Antonio is amazing. Um, you know, all of there's so much good stuff going on around me. I'm just glad to be a part of it. You right, know, I, but you, I, but yeah. you, it, it gets busy and it's work, work, work. I know, just yeah. trying to coordinate. And kind the, of sit down one with of the you. reasons why I like the writing piece is because um, there's not much, perm- other than like the people that you build relationships with. Yeah. There's not much permanence in our business. Like bars and restaurants open and close, menus come and go. Sure. Very few things stick around very long. Yeah. You know, I point. mentioned the Brave earlier because that's like one of those few cocktails that's actually like. A Texas modern classic, or yeah. if you want to call it that, sure, that's sure. like endured all these years, and people people know that Bobby created this drink. Yeah, you know? and um, there's for, what's cool about writing is that like you write this thing, and it can it can endure for a while. Like it can, yeah, it can exist. You know, it'll have its life indefinitely. Uh, I just I found I was looking for a piece. It's not indefinite because I was like I was looking for a piece that I wrote for Condé Nast Traveler in 2008. I, oh, I, wow. wrote, I wrote a, a, a an expose on, on the Mexican martini. <laughs> an yeah, I wrote an expose on the Mexican martini, and uh, and uh, th- that website's been taken down. Like, no they, kidding, they, they don't use it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, I never delete any email, so I was able actually to find the copy I had sent to the editor. Amazing in a, in a Gmail like folder, you know. God bless Gmail. And, and I need it because I needed that uh, that copy. Mm. But anyway, like I, I love. Because it's also funny. It's like finding an old journal. You like me finding like an old article I wrote. Right. It's like when you find it's a journal you wrote in high school or whatever. You're like, oh, I, lo- I was a dork. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I can't believe I was like so excited about this. There, there was like a so interesting enough when I, I I grew up a little bit in Salt Lake City and I was I've always been making whether it's good or shitty demo tapes and stuff. So I made this one like when I was 15 and I didn't even have a copy of it. And then recently, one of my friends from Salt Lake City got in touch on Facebook. She's like, oh, I found this tape of you. And she sent it to me <laughs> like this is almost ah shit t- 10, 10 years later no shit twenty years later sorry and uh, it's horrible but right. it's still cool as like the, an archival interview purpose. or music were you no I was movie? singing and playing guitar and stuff and I got I got better thank mm-hmm. God man because that was horrible but it but it is cool to, to have these relics and these artifacts of your creative life. Yeah. You know, whether it is email, whether it's in print. That's what, some, someday we'll put the blog archive back up. That would be cause, amazing because it's funny to read like. Stupid shit we wrote in 2007. And just format it like old BBC style, you right. know, or, or BBS style, where it's just like yeah. two colors and a form and all that. This was shit. like, I think, before I even had a camera phone, because I remember taking pictures and uploading, having to like upload the, oh, yeah. the picture, you know. With a cable. Yeah, with a cable. God, this, the archaic days. Um, the I, I would encourage people, especially if you ha- have any kind of like basic writing ability, mm-hmm. you know, I would encourage people to find a platform, whether it's a blog or a magazine or a, a book or whatever, yeah. because it, 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 it forces you to formulate your thoughts in a coherent way. Right. You know? right. It forces you to actually like think about what you're saying <laughs> instead of just like putting out some dumb shit. Like right. You see like on Facebook, you know, that's like on Facebook, all, everything disappears, you know, like they say it lasts forever, which Maybe it does, but sure. like, it really doesn't. Like 
something that seems scandalous on Facebook today, it's going to get pushed down in a couple days. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and nobody will remember No one will remember it. it. But like, if you're writing an artif- article for a magazine, like, yeah, most of them end up in the trash. But, but it's like, still there. Someone somewhere is going to find it, especially Absolutely. when you decide to run for public office. Yes. Like, they're going to find that article, that <laughs> last uh, existing copy. Wait, you, know? you don't like Mexican martinis? <laughs> we can't have you running for senator yeah. of Texas. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, true. It'll so, always come back to haunt you. Yeah. So I, I, and also I love a creative outlet, and I think that you know, going back to the idea of like sustainability in this industry, mm-hmm. people, people have to have something that's not the bar. It, it's starting to really drive me crazy, and I'm getting almost like a little cynical about all the freaking updates. Like I, I don't want like, yeah, awesome. You're at another bar. You're drinking again. You were right. doing that the last three nights. I've been watching. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, go do something like maybe you've got a get, problem. <laughs> get all these people that you're drinking with and go play pick up game of basketball or do something like it, it's <laughs> yeah. like you know people need a creative outlet and that's what's it's, you know i told you earlier it's exciting yeah. to hear um these interviews you've been doing with the, these colleagues i know like yeah, oh, yeah. they're all musicians and they've all got these things like uh, i was i was talking to tony abu Ghanem one time and he you know he's an actor uh-huh. and he was telling me about this uh this group that they had a uh like a i think it was tony i may be wrong about that but i, I think he was telling me about uh like a, they had like a barbershop quartet. Oh wow! Uh, was, oh, the portet. I the think it portet. Was no it was shit. like bartenders. It, I think it was Tony. I'm not positive about that, but it was some one of those like kind of you know veteran. Bar yeah, yeah. Because like, Dale was an actor. He was too. like, uh, yeah, Dale DeGraw. I know yeah. Dale was an actor. Tell, you know, telling the story about like, uh, yeah, we had a bartender like a uh, like uh, portet's uh, amazing uh, acapella name. group. Or yeah, whatever. that's incredible. Where's all that shit? Like, I want to see. I would love to see. More of like bartenders getting their bands together yeah. again, or like putting on a stage production or something. I think like that it's, we, we, <laughs> we as a community are so much more interesting than the drinks we make. Absolutely. At the end man. of the day, like drinks are actually pretty boring. Like you know, whatever. I love drinking a good right. drink, but like, what, what else you got? Like, let's what, I totally, tell me about your charity thing that you're doing. I like, totally agree, and and that's the thing that we only get about a couple inches deep. Not to make it sound like some kind of uh, suggestive Don't thing, you. right? Yeah, no, but we do. Like over the bar, you only get so deep with somebody, and you only get to know them so much. And so having somebody here, like sitting down, kind of chatting, getting getting to know the whole story, that's far more interesting and rich. And it it makes it's inspiring to know that so many people are into music, so many people are actors, mm-hmm. so many people were into sports. Like even it, it's it's so strange. And it gives some human element to the industry that, to me, sometimes it's not there because it's so transactional mm-hmm. and it has to be mm-hmm. superficial. It just has to be. There's not enough time. Well, and we're trained. We're trained to keep a lot of our personal life like sort of at bay, right? Because right. You're when you're when you're bartending or waiting tables, your priority is the guest in front of you, mm-hmm. and and it's really about being uh, adaptable to their needs. Like yeah. they talk about. You know the bartenders like the advice columnist, the weatherman, the the talent scout, like right, right, the matchmaker. Yeah. You got to be like all the things to that person there, yeah. except for yourself. You know, and um, and I think that's it's. I, I hope I'm. That's my hope for 2016. Honestly, is that this is the year that people get get outside more, get drink less, yeah, be more healthy and and have healthier, deeper relationships, and like go over to each other's house for dinner yeah. instead of another late night at you know, bar X. Right, right, right. I, I not agree. That I don't think we should support each other's places. No, I, of course, I absolutely of course think we should, that, but, but it is, it is not sustainable. People forget like last year's the year that bartenders died. Yeah. Like the, the like, multiple la- bartenders last year died. was the year that we lost way too many people before their time. Right. And, uh, like, I, you know, I don't want to like be too apocalyptic about it, yeah, but yeah. like the, the industry has had this incredible like decade and a half of unsustainable, like, partying and growth and like, yeah like just this incredible growth in the number of bars and the number of platforms and the magazines and all the articles and all the like it's just bigger 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 boom like conferences and yeah people yeah. are like oh my day rate is two thousand dollars and it's all this stuff and it's like man none of this is like sustainable right we no, can't, can't keep this party going forever especially if you treat yourself like shit absolutely um and and that's do you find that's it hard? what i hope i i was i was shocked to see all the new year's day posts that were like um Fuck you, 2015. Glad to see you go. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. It's yeah. like I had an awesome year. 2015 was awesome. Joe okay, I'm very glad Joe to hear I got that. married. Yeah. I got a great job. Like, but the other thing is, I think every year is awesome. Like, sure. I, I don't dwell on the bad things that have happened. Yeah, because I'm always looking 
But that's forward, the difference forward. between that's just people's <laughs> paradigms, right. you know. But the thing that to your point about the health, the thing that bothered me about it was like, oh, I'm so hungover, so hungover, so hungover. Right. So like it's just repeating and repeating. Like, why do you let right. yourself get to that yeah, point? You like, know, you know how that happened. Actually. That's right. Yeah, and it's it's enabling. I, you know, get, going on a bender is a blast. Love sure. it. You know, it's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> a couple times a year, like I yeah. Go out and have that one crazy night at Tales of the Cocktail yeah. uh, where you go home at sunrise and, you know, don't want to check your bank account. Right, right, right. That's all. It's so much fun. Totally fun. Love it. But on like a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday it's in your much. home market or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's, your just, home like it's just too much. Man. Yeah. It's just not sustainable. What do, what do you do? Because I know you're traveling more than ever. I see you, you've got so many events. You're eating on the road all the time. Like... Do you feel like you're trying, or that it's e- that it's going to be easy for? Because this is a new a new gig, which we'll talk about in a second. But like, do you think that you can maintain healthiness too, traveling so much? Not even that you're drinking so much, but right. just being on the road. So well, much. it's funny. I don't drink very much when I'm on the road. Uh-huh. Um, if I'm in a city where I know someone really well and I haven't like ever like hit the town with that person, yeah. then yeah, that's that can be kind of part of it. Right. But the other thing is like I've been traveling a lot for a long time. Yeah. So it's like I've already torn it up in so many of these places and right. that's just not a priority to me. Mm. Um I wanna like I'd rather go have a good time with one or two people and hit a few spots and have like some meaningful interaction yeah. than just go like light dumpster fires as, yeah. <laughs> as Travis might say. <laughs> Um, not that I don't enjoy a good dumpster fire. Good dumpster fire, dumpster like, fire really, really I mean, helps. You know, I'm just saying, like, you just can't do that all the time. Like, you can't, that cannot be your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, or you'll expire you'll quickly. Just, you'll just burn out, you yeah. know? And I look at, the people who I really admire are, like, Charlotte Voisy. You look mm-hmm. at Charlotte, she's, like, perfectly fit, yeah. beautiful woman. Um, she's been doing this now for years. Like, yeah. she, she's been on the road, you know, several weeks a month for as long as I've known her. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, five or six years now or something that, that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you talk to someone like her and they like get to the hotel. I'm not putting words in her mouth, but sure. I'm, I'm guessing. Like she gets to the hotel and goes to the gym yep, and, and yeah. puts in a workout uh, or goes to an event and has like a club soda. Or, yeah, you know what right, I mean? Like right. there, there are people who've been doing this job for a long time who are like perfectly healthy and fit <laughs> yeah. and not and not. Now it is the minority, but you're and right. Not, there are and some not burned out. Kids. And then there's also, of course, people who totally flame out. Right. And then um, die. But I don't want, like, I, I love this business so much. I've been doing this since I was a teenager. Mm. I want to do this for 30 or 40 more years. And and I can't do that if I just, like, go and, and rage every night. Right. One thing, I'm almost 40, so I don't have the energy to go <laughs> rage every night. Anyway, yeah. but, like, your body will revolt. You it know? will. It, it ages whether you like yeah. it or not. I don't have the, like, endurance that I, I, I actually, I can endure, I can go out and party with the best of them. I just can't get up the next day. Yeah. And, w- and the nature of my job is that, like, I might have a conference call at nine in the morning. That's like, exactly it, right. It, like, it, it is not an option for me to, like, go get blotto yeah. Um, yeah. and paint the town red. Well, so. Um, but unless it's a special occasion. But, like, right. I'm but in, that's, D- but that's I'm in that's DC moderation. tonight is not a special occasion. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I totally understand. Getting married, special occasion. Yeah. Absolutely special. So. Let's let's chat real quick about the the bourbon that you selected. There's lots of stuff, that, you know. There, it's inundated with options for bourbon downstairs. Picking something off the rack, but you picked the Parker's Heritage Fifth Generation, which I think is from I can't remember the years anymore. It's about five years, uh, four years ago, something like that. So probably 2011, 2010, the release. And it's 50% ABV. It is a 10 year bourbon from Heaven Hill that is finished in cognac. What do you think? I love it. It's really nice. I think it's that. delicious. I think it's elegant. It's it's luscious. Yeah. Like it's a palate coder. Um, it's very, it's got that cognac sweetness to it. Right. Uh, I think it's really elegant. I think that I need another pour. Um, <laughs> no, I think no, it's wa- Watch it, David. I, I think know. it's, I think it's beautiful. And I, uh, it was hard. Like I was staring at your, your collection, which is really a nice collection. Thank you. And, uh, and I'm a collector. Sure, absolutely. And so yeah. I see a collection. I'm like, I'm like, oh, this guy's, this guy's a collector, which I, I mean, I knew that about <laughs> yeah, you. But yeah. I, I've never been to your place before. No, no. Thanks um, for coming. But so, you know, for one thing is like, I want to taste something that I either haven't had or don't also have. Right. Because right, right. a lot of the stuff you have, I have. Yeah, as well, for sure. Or I've tasted it before. Yeah. But you've got some hero bottles. I mean, really cool stuff. I'm glad that you don't just have that sort of. When I say lowest common denominator, it's this is a very high bar. But like, yeah. you don't just have a pappy lineup, right, Of the right, current right. pappies, you know, you've got or the current or even the current. You do have. I saw you did have the current Parker's Heritage. Yeah, yeah. You've got five releases ago. Yeah, for and, sure. Um, 
and I, and I don't have that far back. I've got the I've got the next four, I guess, after this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've you know I see this one on you know trading sites. Yeah, and it's like, man, I missed the boat on that bottle. I did too. Like, and it, know, it, I wish I could have gotten it for eighty five dollars. Oh my god, so, it would have been wonderful. Um, but it, but I also haven't mustered up the what how much I don't even was this a four or five hundred dollar bottle three fifty three fifty okay. yeah I guess not a bad price for it it's no, more it's now bad. it's like almost six hundred now yeah and that's a, that's just how insane the gray market is for yeah. bourbon yeah. so you know I hope it's sort of like when we bought our house Tipsy Manor mm-hmm. uh, we bought it from someone who probably overpaid and then there was a recession and we bought it during the recession right right we, we both had jobs and didn't have double mortgages yeah I'm hoping for like the next whiskey reception recession <laughs> when all these people who have these big, all these like uh, I don't know traders or whatever they sure are, have have over invested I'm ready to buy cheap dude you know, me right? too <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm keeping I'm, my eyes gonna, filled I need to put like a I need to put like an escrow account together for, yes. for the whiskey recession because it will come it will it all totally these people will. who are who are paying thousand dollars a bottle for for Pappy or it's whatever, not it's gonna run out that, there's no way those bottles are gonna go down yeah, <laughs> it's gonna it just takes some time yeah well so, it, so it, I, I picked this one because I don't have it I've never tasted it it's it's a type of thing that I, I respect mo- I didn't like the promise of hope in this yeah, series, uh-huh. but all the other ones I've tasted have been amazing. I can't wait. I've got that 27 year old mm. that I haven't opened. That's for the wedding. Um, and that's the one I can't wait to break into. Cause that's fucking really, really hard yeah. to get now. But so it seems like everything, I mean, Jesus, man, like what haven't you done? I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass or any of that, you know, but you've done so much stuff. I mean, you've been, you, you've carried great brands, obviously including St. Germain. You were working with the Cooper spirits, you did. You have a book. You were doing classes. You were in the industry as a server, busboy, all this stuff. And so it is all culminated into what I feel is a really wonderful new title for you and new opportunity with Patron. So what? What is your official title over there now? <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my official title. Yes. Um, we laugh about this at the office. I too, bet. I bet. It seems ridiculous. Yeah. Is manager comma. <laughs> trade, there's a comma there's a comma uh, manager <laughs> comma trade education ampersand mixology <laughs> yeah i'm the manager comma of trade national education. international I, i'm international oh amazing yeah i'm international so i i basically my job is basically a brand ambassador job mm-hmm. if it was in another company we just don't we, we don't have anybody called that and we right, don't use right. that title but i look at you know i look at other colleagues and friends of, of what they do and that's basically what I do. Do you like um, the nine? Uh, what is can be a nine to five? Do you like that shift? I mean, the thing is, it's a it's a nine to like it's a nine a.m. to two a.m. job. You know, yeah. it's one of those things where it, it is. I have never. I've worked hard my whole life. Like I, you know, my first job was at a twenty four hour restaurant. Right when I was when I was twenty years old, I would go to work at ten o'clock at night and get off at seven in the morning. Mm. Uh, managing a staff of you know thirty or forty people like at a twenty four hour restaurant that never closed like we we were open three hundred sixty five never years. closes exactly <laughs> so I'm I'm so used to that and my dad was like that like my dad's a workaholic I'm a workaholic um, the workload is not a problem for me because yeah. I I like I like hard work right and I think I do my best work when I'm busy mm-hmm. busy busy you know um, it is I've never but I've, I even even that. In taking that into consideration, I've never had to work as hard as I have uh, for this job. It's yeah. just incredible because this is a big brand. It's you know, a this is a brand. global brand yeah. that has never had a brand ambassador. It's no never kidding. had a bartender ambassador. It's never had um, a, this position that that other bigger brands and you know, like I say like we are a a brand with a big footprint, yeah. but it's a tiny company. When I got into more into the inner workings of the company, mm. I was stunned to realize that there's like 120 or 30 people that work for this wow. brand. You know, there's brands that have, you know, you look at Bacardi, there's more people working at the office in Coral Gables than, than, than at Patron, in our total, whole company, yeah. you know, Except with, and I'm talking about outside of Mexico. Sure. Sure. Um, there's a big, you know, 1200 people or something down at the, at the production. Yeah. Facilities. yeah. But like, this operational staff yeah right. but i mean like the people who sell and market the brand like it's just t- a tiny tiny crew yeah of you know a few lawyers a few accountants a few salespeople, myself wow. some, you know marketing people. Just, this is not very many people working on the brand yeah um so when you think about it it's really it's like a dream team it's like crazy how much this small group has accomplished with this brand that has like infiltrated the whole country yeah. it's, we're a coast-to-coast brand and now, and now, in, in you know, a couple hundred countries in the world. It's so amazing. So it's it's a it's a cool perspective for me 
because I've only ever worked mom and pop. You know, I've right. worked uh, for family owned restaurants, um, and I've worked for a small family owned spirits company. Right, right. And I've worked, and I've worked, and I've done work. Like my client work, even has all been people like Tito's, Paula's, uh, Treaty Oak. You know, small local Texas spirits. Yeah, companies yeah. With like no discernible marketing budget. You know, <laughs> and that's the that's yeah. the background I come in come from. And we've been doing like I think really cool work with these little brands for years. Right. And to take that background and then translate it to like, oh, holy cow! Now I actually have like resources at my disposal. Yeah. It's amazing. It's it's amazing. Uh, it's like a transformation of my mind because um, what there's really no limit to what I can do with this brand mm-hmm. except for like my own ability to manage it. Right. Like, like it, it's real. It's it's no one. You know, and it's not because like you know we have unlimited funds or whatever, but we have resources. Like we have yeah people, we have agencies, we have a lot of smart people that that are like at our fingertips. Right, so if I right. come up with an idea, like I'm doing this trade thing called International Cocktail Karaoke Champion. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's a trade outreach event where bartenders um, create a drink and match it to a song, uh-huh. their favorite karaoke <laughs> song, and form a, form a band. Yeah, you know, the, band, the band is like four bartenders. Uh, yeah, and you know two of them are singing harmony and two of them are making the cocktail and they've got you know three and a half minutes to to do it to whatever you know pour some sugar on me or whatever. right right uh, and they're gonna do a crusta <laughs> which that's a, bro- a very literal song and quite yeah. good actually you know so so uh they, they performed this live on stage mm-hmm. i had this idea i presented it to my boss i thought he was gonna laugh and he kind of smiled and said go for it you yeah know? uh to test it so he tested it in portland at cocktail week we had like 500 people in this event that we Holy were hoping crap. to get like 150 at. Yeah. And um, it was a riot. Like it was so much fun. It was just a blast. And I realized like, like I, um, I went for, like, so I hired Nick Korn offsite. Offsite is a production company uh-huh. out of Boston. And a good friend of mine runs it. And I hired him to do the event. That's amazing. And I literally flew in from Guadalajara that day, uh-huh. stepped off the plane at like 1.15 p.m. He picked me up. We had some coffee. We went and set up the, put some decorations out, and we uh-huh. had an event. That's, a good, like, that's amazing. All the product, all the design, like all the invites, all the everything that I I have always had to do because yeah. that's because people hire a Tipsy Texan to do that type right, of work. Right, right. And, Pat- and we have done, Patron has hired Tipsy Texan to do that work in mm-hmm. the past, but now I work for the brand. It's like, oh, I just can hire people some, to do someone it, to like, execute someone like it, my, yeah. my company, you know, or it's now Joe's company, but like I, it, I can just hire offsite productions to do this freaking thing. It's amazing, and it's gonna be awesome. And, yeah. all, and all I have to do is like be the MC of the show and yeah, and uh, and process their invoice. You know, it's like I mean, obviously there's more to it than no, that. right? But you you have but there's it's a, whole it's a mindset set. because you look at someone like our vice president of like the marketing events, Pam. Mm-hmm. You know, she will do several hundred events this year. She's one person. Yeah, she has a team of two two other people. Wow. And all of them, like, there's no way they could do. It's incredible. And I'm talking like, you know, they're gonna do. They might do this, you know, the Super Bowl or something. Sure, like, sure. Maybe not right, the right. Super Bowl, but like, they, you know, these big of like big big time events, like not just like little dinky parties. Yeah, um, that's my department. <laughs> um, but like, they, you have to like be like a resource manager. You have to be a talent scout to do that type of stuff. Right, right. Because you're you're managing people who are managing people. You know. Yeah. And and that is such a that's such a shift for me. Um, but it's exciting because it's like, wow, I can do like I can do that in, in ten cities this mm-hmm. year because I've got someone, I've got a team, you yeah. know, and and that's what's cool is that like all of the stuff that I've been like dreaming up and doing either by myself or in collaboration with other people um, all these years, mm-hmm. I can now do it on an international level with like you know a a, a lot of support behind me, yeah, and. Um, and and also, you know, it's a luxury brand. So, like, everything's a class act. I, you know, if I want to buy, if I need to buy, uh, call Javier and get 500 bucks worth of ice uh-huh. so we can have crystal clear old-fashioned ice, nobody's going to be like, that's ridiculous. You can't do that. Right. Because they're going to be like, yeah, we, we spent 10 years making that bottle yeah. of tequila. We don't, yeah, what's what's an extra 50 cents a glass exactly, exactly. For, it, for that Roca Añejo old-fashioned to look awesome? Mm-hmm. And that mindset is cool. Because they're not cheap. Like yeah. they're not. They they don't like uh, scrimp on things. They want everything to be really cool, yeah. and that's that's a standard that I've always held to for years. Um, even when I was like, I remember throwing like my first cocktail party. I'm 18, mm-hmm. and I remember going to Salvation Army on South Lamar, 
and buying glassware because I didn't want to have disposables. As like a teenager, I, I knew that I didn't that I didn't want to get plas- glassware, plastic yeah. cups in my house, you know. And so like that. So working for a brand like this is like we as long as we can make a good argument for it, yeah, and it, it's not like gratuitous or wasteful. We it. can do like the coolest stuff, and you know it's yeah. just and they support it. So they've got some money. They've got obviously global reach. You've got a lot larger role. You've got the ability to impact and influence the whole whole fucking industry. Yeah, and this one, you know, which you already did, but this is a this is a big, this is a major league thing, you know. And I, I'm particularly intrigued and impressed with the efforts to kind of go back to. Just traditional methods. You've got the Roca, which is the tone 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 based process. Yeah, process. So I, you know, I, what what I, I think this brand is hugely misunderstood. I myself was one of those people, you know, who who, be, and this goes back to not having a brand ambassador. When you don't, you know, people say like, oh, if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it for yeah, you, and they'll yeah. get it wrong. That is what happened to Patron Spirits. Yeah, Patron was you know basically too busy selling tequila to actually like talk about the process and talk about how it was made. Uh, and, and, and also, yes, like, like there are some admittedly like flashy aspects, like very slick promotional materials. Mm-hmm. People took that and they say, wow, that's a video. Y'all probably spent a bunch of money on the advertisement. I bet you are cutting corners somewhere or like yeah. people, people made assumptions fill in the gaps, or yeah. it was stuff like uh, some hip hop guy uses it or mentions it in, in his song uh, you guys are just like paying for celebrity endorsements or whatever, and yeah. and that's never happened. Patron doesn't hire celebrity endorsements. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it's just a big piece of the culture, and it's a aspirational brand for in certain markets. And yeah. some people are like, "Oh, yo, I'm drinking Patron or whatever." That just happened. That's yeah. not like you. That's sort of don't blame them for what happened naturally organically, yeah. right? And so, so when I got when I went on my first trip to a Totonilco, um uh, I don't know, 2011, I think. I was with some other, another, just, you know, people you know, like just tequila buddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went down and toured several different places and, and it was very, very cool. My first trip to Patron was last year. I went as the U- USBG ambassador. Uh-huh. You know, we uh, people from all the chapters all over the country are going and I was the representative from our chapter. And I was like, I was sort of blown away. I was like, I'm I'm the guy looking for the diffusers and looking for the auto caves right. and, and being like, this is a traditional tequila production facility. It just happens to be replicated like ten times sure, side, sure. side by side. So it's got a big footprint. Yeah, it's a big facility, but it's not. It's not. It's not big. Like here's uh, fermentation tanks that are two stories tall. It's mm-hmm. not that kind of big. Right. Uh, it's 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 a it's a big small facility. It's it's a big building with a bunch of small facilities under the roof. Right. 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 And. Uh, it was a real eye opener, and people talk about this this Tahona thing. I've I, I've read articles about Patron where it's like even Patron has gotten in on it and started using Tahonas, mm. and I'm like, no, you just found out about it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That this production has always used Tahona because when Francisco Alcaraz, the distiller, was at Siete Leguas back when we were started as a contract brand years and years and years ago, uh-huh. he was doing Tahona and and Roller Mill then. So that process that you know, it just carried over. Was developed at Santi Leguas. He he just copied the process and took it. You know, he took it with him when he opened the, the hacienda distillery. Yeah. So like we've been we've been a Tahona distillate for twenty whatever twenty five years. You know. Wow. So so it was different. You your whole perspective changed. Yeah. What I realize is people. There's people who ha- have this. It's like the difference between. It's like a a policy difference. Versus like a holy crusade. Right. You know, a policy difference is like, oh, you know, I respect what you're doing, but I just don't like how it came out. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. I, I recognize that you have talent, but I don't like the kind of music you play. Right. That's like a policy difference. A holy crusade is like, you're a bad person for this thing that you made that I don't like. Yeah. And it's like, we, I would like people to talk about this brand on, on some objective, you know, uh, terms. Yeah. Where sure. it's like, respect that a lot of these processes that that people are openly talking about now respect that we've been doing that for years yeah respect that we're using copper pot stills wooden fermentation tanks right right uh, brick ovens and and half tahona production yeah and with roca all all tahona at least at least acknowledge that like our environmental practices are are par none Mm -hmm. the um like the 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 employee uh, you, when you walk into this facility, everyone's with like goggles, hard hats, 
knee protection foot like the guys who are cutting the agave before it goes into the to the ornos yeah or are, are, have like boot like boot protection mm. and shin protection so you guys are absolutely concerned about safety it's, it's like the- it's like a modern it's like it's like a modern first world uh distillery in yeah. mexico or model first world like like manufacturing facility right, right, right it's in it's in the hills in mexico but if you walked into it and there's you know water purification and composting operations and reverse osmosis and all this stuff it looks like it could be like outside of Houston, yeah. Because it's that all modern. it's all it's all, it's all stuff that we could totally get away with doing it another way, yeah. But that's not who the company is. The owners of Environmentalist, the uh, the, the 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 foundational principles of the company would not allow you know employees to be losing toes, right? Right. You know, and when I and and I just I would just like the I would like to see some fairness in the discussion because. People, there's a there's a subset of this industry, and you and your you know yours and my colleagues and yeah, friends yeah. have these perceptions that are not based on reality. Sure. And then it's also unfair because you'll see, you know, you, you look at like cottage production in the mezcal business, and this is well, this is absolutely not me disparaging the mezcal business. Yeah. I, I love it. I yeah. drink it. You yeah, and I uh, both are mezcal yeah, collectors, it. so this is not me disparaging that. You've got guys like in open toed shoes. With machetes, sure. You've got chopping there. Wa- I know of a guy watch, who chopped his toe off. Yeah, watch watch mescal producers climbing over like live coals with no eye protection. No, no, no. They're breathing in all that smoke. Yeah, they're out in the woods, you know, or in the hills, exposed to insects and snakes and and all sharp stuff. objects and right. all that. And everybody looks at that and they're like, oh, how romantic, how quaint is that? Yeah. When those are all practices that, if you did it in the United States, would oh, be you, you against get fined or the they take law. You, yeah, absolutely. And then you go to a modern facility um, that's up to safety codes like ours, and we're like everyone's wearing all the proper protection, yeah. and taking stretch break. You know, the girls that work on the assembly or the bottling line are like taking stretch breaks and calisthenics and all this stuff yeah. to not get repetitive stress injuries. And yet somehow, because of the size of or perceived the size success. of our the success of this brand, yeah. We we get like demonized for being like non traditional or an American brand or whatever. I'm like right. an American company that pays well and like has benefits for its employees. Is that what you mean? Like what? I don't want to say. I'm not saying anything bad about the cottage production. Right. But the same people who disparage us for being like reward that. Look at that and not reward it. Like romanticize it. Yeah. And I'm like those people are doing a lot of those production practices because they don't have because because they can't afford. To work in air conditioning, yeah, absolutely. or or to have modern, you know, I'm not suggesting that they change the the practice, the right. production practice for mezcal. I think it's a beautiful thing, and I love it, but it's not sustainable. Yeah. None of that stuff is sustainable, and and so here's a company that happened that makes tequila mm-hmm. that's got a lot of energy focused around sustainability, and that's that is a message that this brand has never gotten out. No, and that's part of my mission. Like I'm going down there 22 times this year. That, that I've already scheduled. Yeah. Cause I want to dig deep. I want to, I want to know all of that stuff and learn it and be able to speak from an educated point of view about it. Right. Because I think we're doing stuff that's like, you know, maybe not unprecedented in the industry, no, but, but I think good. it's, I think it's at the cutting edge of what the industry is capable of. Right. And nobody knows it and nobody talks. And, about and it. we both know so, that. So like, so I would, I would rather someone say, I really respect what you guys do. I think your human rights and your environmental practices yeah. Are, are impeccable i just don't I, I like a different style of tequila yeah which but, totally makes sense and that's fine that's like fair. That's, a, that's, that's totally that's, fair I'll, I'll totally i'll take that totally fair but like you guys are a bunch of dicks just uh, hate right. hating you for your success yeah. i mean haters are gonna hate yeah. and i hate that fucking phrase but that's that is ultimately what it is yeah. and it's good i think that i think it's important that you're in this position to socialize the the true innovation that's occurring at patron but the dedication to equality the de- dedication to safety like all these yeah. kinds of things, these are new to me, and I think it's really important that you speak volumes about them because, I again, like haters gonna hate, and people do hate Patron because they're the ones that were the luxury to get. They were they were it, man, and they're successful doing it, you know. And so it's about time that I think we we, we don't have a better we don't dialogue. Use the, we don't it. say hate that we uh, use the phrase traditionally non-supportive. <laughs> <laughs> are you a therapist? Traditionally. <laughs> <laughs> we, we noticed that you've been traditionally unsupportive. Uh, it's so condescending. Our sources, our sources say, uh, <laughs> "Jesus Christ, it's so <laughs> condescending." I love it. Uh, if I heard that, so be like, "Are you fucking with me?" <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the way I want to wrap this is, 
you know, you and Joe, it's been lovely to get to know you both. And I feel like I know a whole lot more about you now. You guys had an amazing moment together and your wedding was an inspiration to me. I mean, it's sometimes weddings are just so goddamn contrived and you guys had a beautiful ceremony, Bill facilitating, and it was (laughs) so true to both of y'all's personalities. And it makes me looking forward to getting married in April, man. Oh, that's really great. Does. Oh, good. Thank you. Glad we could uh, be a, such yeah. an inspiration. <laughs> in dark times. You know, it, we've been together 10 years. It took like, you know, a Supreme Court case uh, right. to make this possible for us in Texas. But I felt like we were finally ready, you know, from the officiant to the, you know, Daniel Barnes, my buddy on the venue. And yeah. my buddy Matt was helping make drinks. And my buddy Nick and all, Mindy and all those folks who came in from the East and West yeah, Coast yeah. to like make drinks and help out and you know, Marshall Wright helped us get our suits made. And it's like, amazing. Uh, like it was all, it wasn't like there was no like phone book looking up right. except for the inflatable hot tubs. We did have to search like, where do you get inflatable <laughs> hot tubs, but everything else was just friends. You know, it yeah. was just all the homie. It was all this incredible support group that we subconsciously as- assembled around ourselves yeah. over the last decade or more. It, you know what, uh, man? It was so groovy. I'm glad that you totally groovy. I'm glad it, it, it felt like that because that's yeah. what I wanted it to be. It, it was a, a beautiful occasion, and I am always in awe of all of the all of the wheelhouses of which you have horses or hands or whatever. But like you've got your hands on a lot of different projects, a lot of pies, and you seem to just keep fucking knocking it out, man. So. I can't thank you enough for spending time with me and chatting with me and sharing my, my some bourbon. My complete pleasure. Sorry uh, it took us so long to pull this <laughs> off. <laughs> it's always better late than never, yeah, man. Right. It always is. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Well, there we have it, guys. What do you think? It's David Allen, man. I mean, it's David Allen. Tipsy Texan himself, of course, one half of Tipsy Texan. is Joe kind of picks up some of the reins as David transitions into what we discuss here as a very onerous, a very verbose amazingly important title with Patron Spirits. David's been in Austin a long time. He's seen a lot of shit, and it's been amazing to get to know him. We started off on rocky terms, of which I felt I owed him an apology. That's how bad it was. That's how much shit talking I was doing at that particular point. But David also shares some stories of the same nature, and I hope you guys find some value in this conversation particularly because you know honestly i'm gonna say it but without tipsy text and i think a lot of us here in the industry itself we wouldn't have seen our goals the same way we probably wouldn't have been educated in the same way committed to quality in the same way i think that those tipsy texan classes but in full disclosure i didn't attend i wasn't able to they were already sold out but those classes served as this amazing launching point for some brilliant minds in the industry. And that is something to be really proud of, David and Joe. You guys are an amazing, incomparable couple. And thank you so much for allowing me to share some great, insightful conversations with you. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter what Tom Hanks movie you're watching downstairs, how many episodes of Walking Dead there are left this season, hopefully... Negan shows up this one. Please keep dancing.